Hello, and welcome to our Lyme and Book Club. I'm Laura. I'm Deanne. Hi. And I'm Philippe. Uh, and we're reading The Disorderly Nights by Dorothy Dunnett. And uh, we're going to cover part three, chapters 16 and 17, which is the end of the book. Uh, Dee's going to lead the discussion, but any initial reactions you guys want to share? It's over. We finished. We're, we're halfway through the Lyman Chronicles now. Um, yeah, I think Dee and I pegged the ending of this pretty succinctly. I mean, a lot of the stuff yeah. we figured was going to happen did happen. So yeah. I'm not at all surprised that he escaped. Like, that's, I would have been surprised if he didn't escape. <laughs> um, he I almost had he, to escape because he's such a good villain. Yeah. I thought the end was, um, like, I was satisfied with the end of the book. I thought it was really a satisfying ending, but I'm super melancholy about it because, because of, well, first of all, Watt Scott dying was just, ah, uh, that was just heartbreaking. And then, um, although not surprising, like at all and also historically accurate so can't yeah. be mad at Dorothy Dunnett about that but the way she works it into her story to make it seem like it's a part of this actual fantasy fiction is amazing so yeah but that and then just the threats over um Lyman's son just uh just like just the knowledge that like Gabriel has escaped to go and torture this poor baby and like rape him is his plan. Like it just, oh, like explicit plan. <laughs> like it's just, oh, so. So yeah, like I'm glad it's over. It was a satisfying ending in the, in the sense that like Gabriel was like publicly and clearly denounced as this evil villain and everybody saw it and Jarrett saw it and all of that. But um, I really enjoy the irony that the denouncement took place in a church as well. Yeah, that's good. That was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm, um, I, I mean, clearly a hundred percent sure that the next book is going to be Lyman like herring off to parts Middle East to go get his son. Like, obviously that's where we're going. So yeah, I am not surprised by that. I like, we talk a lot about the cinematic quality of a lot of these chapters and like these last two, especially mm -hmm. like the chase through the streets of Edinburgh or Edinburgh, however you say it, uh, and um, just then the just sort of the wild by fire slash fight in the church. Yeah. Um, I just love how Lyman was able to spring that trap on him so succinctly, even though Gabriel had one last card up his sleeve, which we knew about, but. Yeah, you know, it, it sort of reminded me, this, is, this may not be a good connection, but it really reminded me of, I don't know if you've seen Lady Hawk, the movie, oh my okay first of all what <laughs> Both of you need to immediately see this film <laughs> so this isn't gonna make any sense but for all of you listeners who've seen lady hawk um there's a scene where rutger hauer uh confronts who's the hero in the film confronts this uh corrupt priest um in a gorgeous church and there's like sun streaming down and it's it's like this sort of battle confrontation that happens inside a church and it it just reminded me of that. Yeah. I always thought a young Rutger Hauer would make a perfect Gabriel. Oh, you should definitely watch Lady Hawk. Like, <laughs> I think you would really like it. I, I love him, so I will watch it. <laughs> it's, it's really good. It's like, the, I think it's the one role I've seen where Rutger Hauer is actually not the villain. He's the hero of the story. And it's- That is rare. It's really good. Um, anyway, it's also cheesy in the 80s. And like, I'm not saying it's the best film ever. Everything I love. That is fine. <laughs> anyway, um, back to the story we're actually talking about. Um, yeah, I agree. It was totally cinematic and epic. This, like, these two night. You know, I mean, I, to me, Lyman is also a knight. Like, he's just he's just like this hero that's fighting for good at, at his heart. And so these two men con confronting each other, like in front of the altar, and. And then also even just like the, the fight with Jarrett in the little hut, you know, it was also just this incredibly dramatic, like tight, you could just see like a camera sort of coming in this very tight confined fight in, in that space. And 
Yeah. Good um, moment. I, I love the scene in the church. It's one of my favorite battle sequences. Um, I think the sword fight with Richard is maybe my like ultimate favorite, the one in Game of Kings. But anyway, um, one of my favorite Lyman travel experiences was going to Edinburgh and going to St. Giles Cathedral. And like, because the trip was so tight, I had like 15 minutes at most in there. And it was with a Lyman group. So I was with someone else and we both like left the group to go into the cathedral and like try to retrace the battle. So like I had the book on my phone from like the Kindle version and we're like, wait, Southeast, right? So that would have been there. And then that would have been there. We wait a second, you were with the Lyman group and they didn't want to go into the church? No, because um, I, I guess they, you know, they do gatherings in Edinburgh every year. So I'm sure they've been there like a bunch of times already, but I having not, um, and this other person, um, Peter, um, also hadn't um, ever been in it since this was our first time going to the Lyman event. So we were like, we're darting out and like running from the event to St. John before it closes. Yeah, I would have liked to spend a lot of time in there too. Yeah. I want to see the altar at the very end of the book, the one, the St. Gabriel altar yeah. off to the side. Like, I would like to see that. It turns out I was looking for the um the little chapel, Lauder Chapel, where Lyman makes a vow, but it's not there anymore, alas. Oh. But I look at the spot where it would have been. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was this was good. I I it was a fitting into the book and mm -hmm. really leads us into the next book. Yeah. It's the first of the well, we've only read three of them so far, but it's the first that actually has like a cliffhanger that succinctly leads you into the next. So there's like continuing action because the other two, you know, I'm glad they weren't, but either one of them could have been the end of the series. This yeah. one, if this was the last, you'd be very unsatisfied. Yeah, this one definitely is like a part part one of something. The other two had a, a defined ending and yeah, it could have just ended. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is part one. I hope it's not part one of four. Like, I really would like, I hope that we don't have cliffhangers for the rest of the books, but um, but I liked this one. I just, I'll, I, I'll say that this is my favorite of the three so far. Mm, yeah, well, I think me too. Well, I think I, there are moments in the other two that I really, really love, but I think as a whole, this book was my favorite of the three. And I'd even go say the second half. The first half was all right, but mm. I liked the the Scotland part a lot more because you know it picked back up with a lot of the characters, even though too many of them died. Um, yeah, I, I think I, the more clear it became that Gabriel was evil, the more I liked the book because yeah. because I liked that standoff between the two of them. It is so fun to reread and see all the little devious manipulations he's doing all along. Oh my goodness, there are parts where I was doing that explanation where I was right, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to reread that scene. I have to reread that scene. <laughs> it's all there. And the conversation that Lyman and Dragoot had in the garden where he was talking about, uh, I forget the name, sorry. Oh, um, in the tent. Sigal Dean or something? Yeah, the peacock angel. Yeah, yeah. It makes so much more sense now. Yeah. So. They ignore the tears, watch his hands. What's he yeah. actually doing? Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't decide if this one's my favorite because I kind of go back and forth between the first, the third, and the fourth. Um, but I definitely love this one. I actually love the multi parts the most, probably because the Scotland parts are so traumatic from all the people dying that I don't reread it as much. Mm. But I just love all the action of the multi parts and I love the like hyper focused concentration on Lyman, Jarrett, and Gabriel and just what a freaking mess their whole relationship is, which once you know he's evil and you go back and reread is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely rereading this book. It's, it's, you can just tell that it will be rewarded. Like the second read is super rewarded. So, yeah. All right, should we dive in? Okay, let's dive in. So we've got chapter 16, Jarrett chooses his cross. Um, and this one, this chapter is kind of goes to a lot of places and we sort of have scenes in, in various things, but it's basically, um, we're with Jarrett for most of it. There's there's some parts where we're like with other people, but we're mostly following Jarrett through this see, this chapter, which I liked, even though I still find Jarrett annoying. Um, I liked having this chapter from his perspective and sort of seeing his journey from the beginning to the end was really nice. Well, he so, kind of represents like the view that the outside world has of Gabriel. Uh, so 
it's really satisfying to see his opinion change and his loyalty shift from Gabriel to Lyman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? He like yeah. represents what we want for like everyone who is under Gabriel's spell. Yeah. I do hope that he continues on in the series as well, because I'd like to see how his character grows now that he's not under the yoke of Gabriel anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there was a line at the end of this of chapter 17 where was it in chapter 17? I know there's a point where Jarrett says he's staying with Lyman and Lyman's just like, oh, thank God. You know, I mean, like he has this incredibly emotional response to that statement. I'm like, and that one response made me go like, okay, maybe he can stay. <laughs> like, That's like one of my favorite parts of this entire book. Just because Lyman awesome. has been holding that emotion in for so long. Yeah. This is what I said earlier, like you kind of see little hints of it. Like Lyman really, really likes Jarrett and cares about Jarrett so much. And that's when it finally comes out. And like, it doesn't entirely make sense. Like, why do you like him so much? But he does and it's adorable. Yeah. And I mean, he, there is a couple of places or at least one place I noticed where it's like his childhood friend, da, 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 you know? So there's this, you, you just kind of wonder if Jarrett to him is a reminder of like his life before trauma. Like, I mean, his childhood was traumatic, but his young adulthood was massively traumatic. So, so like if Jared was, Jarrett was part of his like concept of himself before all this trauma. And so if that's one of the reasons that he cares about him so much and wants to save him so badly and all Just of that. as long as he stops touching Lyman's back. I know. What is up with, it's like everybody forgot that he was whipped within an inch of his life, just like, you know, well, days before. Not everybody, but Jarrett specifically, which is a very Jarrett thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so at the beginning of the chapter, Jarrett, Flippa, and Nicholas de Nicolay go to Mig Coulter, which, yay, Flippa. I, I, I did love her in all of these, even though she is one of the reasons Gabriel gets away at the end, but I still, I still love her in, this, in these chapters. Um, and Adam Blacklock, he comes off lovely too. Why do you love Adam here? He just, he's got like, um, I don't know. I just, I just feel like he's got, uh, stability and he feels very Lyman-esque without the, um, without like the genius of Lyman or the, the sort of sparkle and like extra stuff of Lyman, but Adam Blacklock, he seems like a nice, um, like Lyman Jr. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I just get that feeling. So I like it. I especially enjoy in this chapter. I don't remember exactly where it is. We'll get to it. But um, I think Adam feels like out of everybody in St. Mary's that he might be the most useless at times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he really shows his yeah. work by right. providing the, the sketches that he did. Yeah, 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 exactly. It really helps prove Gabriel is not a great guy yeah so. like that's one of the reasons i feel like he's he kind of reminds me a little bit of lineman is that he's he has this self-image that's so bad like he's not worth he's not as helpful and yet and he's kind of like well sometimes i can be useful you know <laughs> it brings out this super useful thing mm-hmm. so, yeah exactly um but anyway the Jarrett, flippa and nicholas go to see richard and sibylla basically <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so thoughts about that um Jarrett is like beginning to be um to be divided it says his heart is beginning to be divided but I noticed that his concept if you look at 550 at the top it says like Gabriel seems totally indifferent to what happens which I highly doubt is true <laughs> <laughs> like it feels like that's one of Jared's just complete misunderstandings of what's going on and that Gabriel's actually furious about what has happened who's my guess yeah yeah I mean Gabriel's just faking like being super tra- trauma because he has to find a way to explain away killing his sister so he acts like he's oh I'm so traumatized by this but like you know it's just bullshit um, but yeah. I, I do think like the here's a line that highlights the transformation um, Jarrett goes through in this chapter is on 551 where he's talking to Philippa and she's saying that um, Gabriel actually knew Jolito was rotten. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, whoever is to blame in the whole bloody mess, it's not Graham Mallet. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just wrote to the side and wrote, oh, geez. Like, 
<laughs> Get it together. But it makes sense. Like, I, I think it would have been really unrealistic if he was just like, like a snap of the fingers, like, oh yeah, um, Gabriel's bad. I get it now. Um, he has to go through this whole like realization. And then he like, goes back and has to try like, you know, saving him, like bringing, finding that good person that he believed was in there. And it's only after he really tries that, that he finally gets like, oh, this guy's psycho and evil and he's not going to change. But he, ha he it, it's much more realistic this way. He wouldn't. Just, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. I just still think he's an idiot. Like, yeah, he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, it's like, sure, I totally agree. It's realistic the way she wrote it. I just, I'm just like annoyed by him still massively. Um, I love Philippa's comment of like, uh, says, um, says disarmingly, <laughs> Sir Graham is a very wicked man, isn't he? To try and put a sword through someone unarmed like that without even a trial. And she's kind of poses it as a question, you know, like, isn't he? <laughs> like, yes, yes, he is. I, I also love Philippa um, when they're about to give the news to Madame Donati and she's standing on the stairs and Philippa just comes in so like practical and thoughtful. And she's like, the stairs, said a definite Somerville voice from below them, are no place for emotion. You could get a nasty fall. Right. <laughs> Somebody's going to fall down the stairs. We should go. <laughs> she's just so practical. Yes, yes. It's like, pick a direction, go up or down. <laughs> and then when you're standing somewhere safe, uh, we'll tell you that Jolita's dead. Right, 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 right. Um, uh -huh. And then I love you guys um, asked a great question a couple like episodes ago where you were like, what is going on with this duenna? Does she know? And here we find out she knows a lot. Um, and we get the revelation that um, she knows that Gabriel's evil, and and even though Gabriel had the two grooms killed, he didn't have her killed, so she's able to provide evidence against him as well. Yeah, and this does not surprise me. Like I think I would have been shocked if she had not known what was going on, because like the way her role with Jolita is like there's no way she didn't know what was going on. But I actually really love her reaction, which is um, she still loves Jolita, even though she knows everything Jolita has done because she sees Jolita accurately as a victim of Gabriel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and her perspective makes perfect sense. Her poor, helpless craving for love, uh, yeah. which like if you were her duenna, like of course you like, you yeah. wouldn't just hate her. You would feel sorry for her and want to protect yeah. her. And, and she would have seen her in all of her vulnerable moments like, and we only see Jolita in like her, you know, angry, mean, lashing out moments, but that doesn't mean that she didn't have a lot of scared, sad, vulnerable moments that, that this woman would have seen, so. I think it's telling also that she's only revealing all of this after she finds out Jolita is dead, mm -hmm. which means to me that even though she knew all these awful things about Gabriel, she was protecting Jolita by not saying anything because I think she kind of knew that Gabriel would discard Jolita as soon as he wasn't used, as soon as she wasn't useful to him anymore. Right. Right. Well, and Jolita would be painted with the same brush. Like if she, if she denounces Gabriel, she denounces Jolita. There's no, there's no way to not do that. So. The one aspect I don't think she knew is that ugh, Gabriel was the father. No, she did. She Does she, she know that? Did. Yeah. yeah at the end she yeah it says she knew at the end oh oh god yeah. i knew that was going on oh, like, it was so funny when you said that i was like how did she figure that out <laughs> i knew that was happening i was like it was just so creepy and i was just i was just thinking like what is the ultimate horrible creepy thing he could do and it's like well assault his sister like <laughs> yeah so yeah i knew that was happening oh you picked oh, up on it. it's definitely it's like subtle but it's there um yeah oh, yeah. So, yeah uh yeah so yeah 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 and i love nicholas in this scene because he really does like he kind of manipulates madame donati into telling everything because he's the one who sort of paints the picture of like Gabriel betrayed her and doesn't mention anything about Lyman and Jared's kind of like he's not telling the story right and but everything <laughs> he says is true actually oh yeah it is but but Jared's just kind of like he wouldn't have said it that way and it's clear that Nicholas just knows what to say to get the duenna to, to say everything and I'm like oh go Nicholas very smart yeah 
Yeah. And then, but we don't actually get the clear, like she says, I love it. Tell us, said Sibylla gently in her tone of friendliest interest. <laughs> sort of just, Let's have a cup of tea and we can chat about <laughs> what Sir Graham is like. And then you get a cut and we don't know. <laughs> so I, I love that. The, I love the way that um, Dorothy Dunnett does that, where it's like, we know this super important conversation happened, but we don't actually get to see it on screen. So, you know, on screen. So it will play out later in the chapter, but you're like, what did she say? What did she say? I think it makes sense also because we, we already pretty much know what she's going to yeah. say. Um, and the important part is that Jarrett hears it. And it's really yeah. hard for Jarrett to not believe this because why would she be long, you know? Yeah. This is like the brunt of the proof against Gabriel that Jarrett gets. I mean, he still thinks he can go back and save him, which he realizes eventually that that even is not going to happen. But like, if he hadn't heard this from the Duenna herself, I I don't know that he would have gone seeking out Lyman the way he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, and I think like he he has this like, I've been such a fool. I've been a thick fool. I was like, yes, you have. Um, <laughs> yeah, I highlighted that. Like, yep. Yeah, I, I wrote off to the side, like, yes, way. you have. Um, but Sibylla, I thought Sibylla was really kind in what she said, where she says, I know, but there's such comfort in numbers, don't you think? And so it just, just like, yeah, we were all fooled, you know? <laughs> I think that's one of the funniest lines in the entire book though. Because <laughs> um, he says he's been a thick fool and she's just like, I know. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Welcome to the club. Although he was more foolish than everyone else. He was else. more fooled than she was, yeah. He was the leader of the fools. Um, yeah, okay. So any other thoughts on, they have this discussion about um, the baby. And everyone seems to be universally in agreement that Lyman should never know that he has a kid, which I understand why they're saying that, but. <coughs> yeah, I mean, if people had not ever, if no one had said he shouldn't know, then he would know and we wouldn't have this problem right now. <laughs> they're just making it worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the whole bit about, you know, the hot trot and just realizing how much it was laid out um, by Gabriel. Wait, what page uh, are you on? 553? Yeah, 554, 555. Um, yeah. I like Sibylla's reaction, though, to hearing about the child, which is um, her voice is clear voiced and dogged. Um, with the tear stains spreading dark on her dress. So we get like the intense emotion, but also her practicality. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this like pray that Gabriel does not know what we know and it's like, oh, he definitely, he knows. <clears throat> so, yeah. It's, it's an interesting tactic, like letting the reader know this whole time that he knows and then slowly the characters find out. So it's like this like weight hanging over everything that you're aware of and you know it's gonna have ramifications but you don't know when yeah I, I also love the little indication at the bottom of this page where we just see another sign of Lyman's um just kind of plans of within plans you know and he's got plan a plan b plan c plan d you know it's like and if one fails we go to the next one so he had this like okay if things go bad and i have to escape here's where i'm gonna be like this day and this i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna go here and then i'm gonna go here and gonna, like find me whenever you can and i was like that's such a great idea <laughs> and solved a lot of problems like it could have been bad and it wasn't because he's smart He's very, very smart. And very prepared for almost everything. That's a big part of the fun of the books. It's just how, like watching how smart he is and how creative. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one of the, <clears throat> one of my favorite parts of the books is thinking that there's a disaster and then it turns out not to be a disaster because Lyman planned something or thinking that something's going to be okay and then he misses one thing and it's a disaster. Like, like, you know, like both of those things happening over these past three books has been really fun to read. Yeah. So. Well, and it always, it makes it so that whenever he does miss something, it's like really bad and really intense because he's so on top of things that like, you know, 
it's it's uh, it's going to be intense when he when he misses something. Yeah, yeah. Um, what did you guys make of the message Sibylla sends, which is I have a new cat. <laughs> um, well, I I so I thought. Um, I thought the real, well, the real, it seemed like, tell him I have a new cat, is that all? And then she says, and that George Paris landed at Dumbarton today, I'm told, and means to leave shortly for a lodge in Edinburgh. Like, I think that's the real message that she's sending to him. But the have a new cat is just, it seems like uh, just a message like, I'm okay. Because like, Jalita killed her cat. And so, I have a new cat. But, I mean, I didn't think of anything other than that too much. Is it supposed to have a deep meaning? I don't, I just feel like it's, I don't know what it means. I, I assume it's something like, you know, don't worry, I'm fine. Yeah. You're going to be fine too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's an odd thing. Really, I killed the cat, but I have a new cat, so. It's one of those things I always feel like maybe I'm missing something though. I don't think so. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't see anything deeper into it. She's just, yeah. it's her way of saying everything's fine. Yeah. Yeah, she probably yeah. does have a new cat. So, yeah, I think it, I think it's just like we're moving on. We weren't damaged too much. Go forward with what you're doing, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. At least Kevin's okay. I mean, yeah. Jolita didn't manage to do anything with to him. It will never cease to entertain me just thinking about Francis Crawford of Lyman uh, over the funeral of the cat, presiding over the funeral. Of- <laughs> Like it's really bad that her cat died. I feel terrible about it, but right. I mean, as, the, as the like conductor of the funeral, amazing. I love that they had a funeral for the cat. <laughs> it's great. So what then Jarrett goes to Lyman. <sighs> so the whole scene is told in darkness. So Jarrett doesn't see visually how sick Lyman is, but yeah, you think he could use his brain and figure it out. Yeah, like, it's not like he doesn't know what happened. And it's not like he doesn't know the impact of what happened. Like, I think Lyman is so good at putting on this facade of always being fine. It's the same thing that happens with Will Scott in the first book, where Will doesn't believe that he's human and is so shocked when he faints. Um, I think Jarrett has the same thing. He sees him as a machine. And so then when he's really sick, like, this just doesn't fit in his concept of who Lyman is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you see that it's like uh, he sees Lyman as like the Deus ex machina to destroy Gabriel. You know, that's what that's what he says on five fifty seven. And then he says to Lyman's cool brain, it was inevitable. He must have set out deliberately to expose Graham Mal a long time ago. He spared nothing, and it just goes on like he's talking about like it's logical. It's logical that Lyman had sensibly saved his own life. And he just, yeah, like you're saying, he's got this like mechanistic view of Lyman that he's just a robot almost. And he's a machine and he's cool and he's just an intellect, but not an emotion. And uh, it's so wrong. No, it's not true. Um, One of my favorite lines in here is actually um, that bit, uh, it's at the top of 557, um, where Jared is thinking about Lyman um, and he's, he, he develops an illogical resentment that Lyman is going to be the one to take down Gabriel um, because Lyman has so many failings. And it's just such a Jarrett thing. Like, he's just, you should just be glad that someone's exposing this evil villain. And instead, you're just resentful that it's Lyman. At least, at least he knows it's illogical. Yeah, um, yeah. He's so illogical. It's just, it, he's so driven by these emotions that make no sense. It's just very entertaining about Jarrett. And it's like to destroy Gabriel's great name. Like even knowing all these terrible things about Gabriel, he's still like, like that this wicked man with all his failings is the one who's going to take down this great, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, idiot. Um, yeah. So there you go. At least he apologizes to Lyman. Does he? Yeah, at the bottom of 57. I thought that was Lyman apologizing to Jarrett because now Jarrett knows the truth. Yeah, that's Lyman. Really? Yeah. yeah. Ah! <laughs> I thought it was Jarrett because I couldn't imagine that. Like, I was like, Jarrett's the one who needs to apologize. He does, but I, I can see Jarrett saying, I'm sorry, but I can't see him saying, I am deeply sorry. 
Yeah. You know, that's how I knew right away. Oh, so this is alignment. It is a little bit unclear that paragraph, but. No, you're yeah. absolutely right. It's alignment. alignment. And that annoys me even more because it should have been like, Jared should have walked into that, that cabin and said like, I am so sorry. But it's, it makes perfect sense that Lyman would because Lyman has seen Jared as a victim of Gabriel this whole time. And now Jared's illusions have been shattered and he feels really bad for Jared because Lyman is such a good person underneath. I know. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's also another hilarious um, Jared line is when he says he's going to go back. And Lyman's like, there's only two intelligent reasons to do that. And Jared's answer is, my reason is not an intelligent one. No. <laughs> true. At least he knows it. At least he's got some self-awareness. He's just such an idiot. Oh, man. Um, <clears throat> I also can't imagine Jared actually spying on Gabriel. Like, that would never in a million years work. Of course, he knows that it wouldn't work, but like... Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. But also, I thought on 559, I thought Jared just said... I had a hard, I got mad at him because he said that he says this thing that's got to be incredibly hurtful where he says, really, there isn't much to choose between you, is there? And it's just like, what? And to say that to Lyman's face, knowing everything he knows is just... Well, remember, he's been through this disillusionment in Gabriel, but he hasn't been through an enlightenment in relation to Lyman. So all the things he hated about Lyman, he still thinks Lyman is bad. It's I don't think it's until he starts to see like how how Lyman has suffered to take down Gabriel that he maybe he starts to reevaluate. And then he has the conversation with Nicholas to Nicolay. Like he definitely reevaluates Lyman and comes to that moment of I should like to stay, but that hasn't happened yet. So he still yeah. has a very bad opinion of Lyman. And Lyman has just said like, it's a clever and powerful man who can find pleasure in a vast despotic scheme like this and work towards it secretly for years if necessary. And then Jarrett says, there's nothing much to choose between the two of you. It's just, I just think, I just don't have any excuses for him. Like, I think, no, it, he has clearly, yes, he's disillusioned. Like he has this wrong feeling about Lyman, but there's no reason for it. Like he has, he is smart enough and he is like, he should have seen this. And it's I, like, I'm glad he's coming around, but that was cruel. That was a cruel statement and he should have known better. And yeah. I think the key to Jared though is that everything he does is driven by these illogical bursts of emotion. So even though he has a logical capability to extrapolate that Lyman isn't evil, he, he doesn't use logic. He just bursts. Yeah. Out. yeah and I, I just know. I also don't think he's had enough time to process things yet. Sure, he's come around to seeing that Gabriel is wicked and does all these things, but I don't think he's really gone through moment by moment and realized how deeply he's been manipulated into hating Lyman for false reasons. Maybe, but we went immediately from this in the book from one scene to the next scene, but he didn't go immediately from one scene to the next scene. He had a pretty long horse ride. <laughs> like, even if it's just a couple of hours, like, you can do some thinking in a couple hours. And even just, then. Yeah. Number one. <laughs> no. I just, do what? I said, this is Jarrett. Yeah, I don't, I just, I don't, I can't with him. Like, I I, I, he has not redeemed himself yet for me. No, <laughs> like, and I agree. I don't think he should. I don't think you should feel that way. But, and I'm not asking you to, to change your opinion on him, but I do think he's not quite there yet. And even at the end of this book, even when he believes more, I think he's still got a lot of work to do in realizing. Yeah. I mean, that's what I blame him for, that he's not quite there yet. Like, yeah. it's like, really? You're not quite there yet? Like, here's worshiping Gabriel. Yeah. Worshiping yeah. Gabriel. Obsessively, yeah. like, in love with Gabriel, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> no, I cannot with him. Um, and then he went, decides he wants to convert Gabriel. Like, he's an intelligent one. Yeah. That the hopeless piece of missionary work, as Lyman puts it. Anyway. Yeah. 
I like Lyman's line of uh, think of the damage a good and simple man can do under the terms that, you know, power that Gabriel has. Um, what do you suppose an evil and most damnably intelligent one would do? And I like that because it is like, um, it's a really good case because there is a so much opportunity for a good and simple man in a position of power to, to make things really, really bad. So to have someone actively trying to make them terrible um, and intelligent enough to do it effectively is pretty scary. Yeah. And Lyman dropped everything to stop this guy. Yeah, yeah. So then after all that, Jared decides the best thing to do is have a battle with Lyman in this hut, which is just... But also Lyman decides, no, Lyman is the one that decides to fight him to keep him to, from, to stay. And this is Lyman being an idiot too, because he's like, even though I'm super feverish and my back is, you know, horrible, like I'm totally going to just like take him down and stop him from escaping. And of course it's They're both dumb in this moment, like so dumb. Yeah. I mean, they have a fist fight and a sword, well, sort of a sword fight, sort of a fist fight, sort of a wrestling match. I don't know. A little tent. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about it? It's just men being dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much all it is. I mean, Lyman is, at least has the excuse of being feverish, like he's not thinking yeah. right. <laughs> right. That's true. We can. Whereas Jared just never thinks right. Uh, and then Archie and Alec, like I understand that Lyman told them to go away, whatever. But I'm like, really? <laughs> you guys could be the voice of reason here. But. Yeah, they, and then they come in and they're like, they're really torn about between like obeying Lyman saying to keep Jarrett there at all costs versus just like, get the fuck out. We, we're done with you. Yeah. And they let him go. <laughs> I know. I know. And I mean, I'm kind of glad they let him go because it does let Jarrett see, like he does get a clearer vision of Gabriel because he goes back, which he wouldn't have gotten. Like, I think you're right. He wouldn't have, if he hadn't made that attempt, he wouldn't have gotten that clearer vision of Gabriel. But still, they should have kept him there. Oh, well, just they should have. Uh, they're supposed to follow Lyman's orders. He doesn't give yeah. them a reason. I mean, that said, I think he was probably wrong to try to forcibly keep Jared there. Yeah. But yeah. typical Lyman, it's for Jared's own good. Yeah, yeah. I think he was worried about Jared and so wanted to keep them there. But it would have been a mistake because Jared does not have the mental acuity to make this leap without seeing it himself. So. He's very lucky that Gabriel didn't just kill him. Though. Yeah, look at how many people Lyman has lost up to this point. Like, yeah. he certainly doesn't want to lose Jarrett, especially now that he just got him back after all of these years, so. Yeah, yeah. He's just starting to make leeway and being like, that guy you idolize? Satan, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> FYI. Like, you're not worshiping God. On the devil. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, there's another one. Um, they were the same age. Oh. In case you didn't notice. Yeah. So he that's so that makes him what 25. I've kind of stopped paying attention to this. I'm so I got so annoyed with the age thing. So he's what 25 now? Jared's 25. Jared's 25. So Lyman's 25. Like if probably in the range. Yeah, I don't know if she means like the same age, like the same year or like within a couple years, but it's another hint of how old Lyman is. Late 24 to early 26. Like, okay. <laughs> She's just dragging this out. I'm like, whatever. How old are they? If he's 25 now, never mind, but we'll figure it out later. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot deal with that. <laughs> You'll know eventually, don't worry. Okay. Uh, uh, so then when Lyman wakes up, he fires them both and they refuse to go. <laughs> <laughs> like you're gonna drop dead like the good and loyal men that they are yeah. which is lovely actually um that they're just like oh stop like and he's got this awful fever and he just like basically passes out and archie drugs him to sleep oh i know archie and the drugs yeah so then we get this whole sort of explanation of what's been going on well, hold on and... before that no well, are you moving on to the next section or are you still in this section? Well, I mean, Archie Drugs Francis is the end of this section. So do you, do you have anything else you want to say about it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go for it. Uh, well, uh, one of the things is, is Lyman's um, 
talking about taking the thicket of thorns versus the primrose path and saying someday I must take my own prolific advice and contrive to drop dead, um, which I think is an important little character note on him in case we forgot that he was actively suicidal in the first book. This guy has some issues. Yeah. Only a few. And then there's, there's actually a line that references that later that I highlighted. Let's see if I can find it. He's early. Where, is it earlier? Yeah, because he made the comment to Jarrett about like Jarrett taking the, the, the thicket of thorns to go back to Gabriel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that no one with theological training is ever going to believe that nine times out of ten, what is best for one's character is the primrose path, not the thicket of thorns. Um, yeah, <laughs> totally. And the, like, it always reminds me of people who say, like, um, you have to get out of your comfort zone and like do things out of your comfort zone. I hate that phrase because I feel like your comfort zone is where your talents are and where your passion is and where your like all the things that you're meant to do and be like that's your comfort zone and you should live in your comfort zone and work out of your comfort zone and be in that and I hate the phrase like you just have to get out of your comfort zone and it's, it's like that like you have to walk the thicket of thorns you know it's like no be where you live where you are in your heart and your passion ah. I think really stands out in this scene is Alec Guthrie because we know Archie is really caring and Archie kind of gives him a pep talk about you know um, we need to stay here because you're going to die without us um, but then Alec comes in and, and also gives him a pep talk and talks about how like Lyman talks about how he he can't even tell if what he did with Jolito was the right thing and Alec gives him this pep talk that's like she was going to die no matter what like you did the right thing yeah. and Alec is actually like really lovely and faithful and loyal here they both are like all yeah. like really good people yeah and it's like you made the moral choice like don't worry yeah yeah i agree it's the the these men around lyman like alec and adam and abernathy they're all archie they're all a names <laughs> archie and adam and alec and, um they're just i really like the way their characters have developed you know we're seeing bits and glimpses of them i hope they stick around like if, if Lyman takes this army, if Lyman takes St. Mary's to the continent or whatever, I don't know, maybe he will, but I hope they stick around. Okay, now we can move on. <laughs> Although he does seem to kill people, like poor Tosh, like maybe, maybe Archie's next, you know, <laughs> like it's just gonna start killing off the, it's like, oh, sad. Anyway. Okay. No, I lost, I lost my place. Where are we were? 565. Okay, 565, yeah. Um, so then we get this section where it's kind of telling us what's going on. Um, and Adam does have that moment of like, his art is, it comes in useful sometimes, you know, in Met Lyman's eyes. And you're just like, oh, that's so good. Um, and, and Kate has this lovely moment where she's like, she decides not to go drag Philippa back she's just like well she has to left her where she was Kate stayed where she was gnawing her nails so she's super worried and had left Philippa to do her growing up without interference you're just like okay I, I love that yeah I mean, Philippa is only 13 but people grow up faster back then and I like that she lets her you know she we know how much she loves her and wishes she could swoop in and keep her a safe child forever but lets her do some growing up I also, I like the bit from Fergie about we could get uh, blood wit off of him. Um, oh. He's like, he wants the 50 pounds. Yeah, it's it due to buy a bloody memorial with is Lyman's or something. Yeah, Lyman's just kind of like, what? Which is it's just super funny because like Fergie's a lawyer, so he's like using his lawyer brain and this is what he comes up with. He's like, hey, <laughs> we can get you a little bit of money. It's like I work with like a lot of engineers and it's like sometimes they, they find the detail that's completely irrelevant to the goal, but like there's right. Like the details. Right, right, right. Instead of taking down this man and preventing him from doing like the, the amount of damage that he could possibly do, let's just sue him for some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um yeah, so we have this conversation with Adam. I mean, that he's so Adam's talking with Sibylla. And 
it's just, I don't know, it's just neat that he's, <laughs> Sybilla's so annoyed that she's like, this all could have been over if you didn't care about this band of men, like this army. And uh, yeah, so, and then she says, and I think she says that she's interesting where she's like, so that all this endeavor and all this danger is endured for one reason, the leadership of one excellent small force, which Francis cannot bear to see fall into the wrong hands. Does it matter? Um, and then she turns to confront him and says, or is Francis merely bewitched by his own little creation? Then Richard actually steps in and defends Lyman. Yeah. Francis knows very well what he has done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Richard has actually this very insightful, like, no, this is a problem and he has to actually take care of it. But yeah, I, that's such a mom thing to say though, right? Like, <laughs> she's like, my son is in danger. Why is this important? <laughs> you know. Um, and Philippa tries to help at the end. I know, with the baby comment. And Someone explain to me why that misfired. Because Sylvilla knows about the Lyman's baby. So right. Sylvilla says, mother always says that when the worst is happening and your knees are rattling like Swiss drummers, there's nothing like a baby to give you a sense of proportion. Right. And of course, Sybilla's thinking about this sense of proportion coming from this baby that's lost out there, you know, being potentially tortured and used by Gabriel. Yeah. Okay, that's the, I don't know why I didn't put that together, but I was like, what's wrong with what Philippa said? Why is everybody upset about it? I thought it had something to do with Kevin. And I was like, did I miss something? But that makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think Philippa's the only one in that scene that doesn't know about the secret baby that they're all keeping from Lyman, which is horrible. Like if they told him ahead of time, maybe he could at least prepared himself for that mm. moment with Gabriel. I don't think Adam knows. He would have yet. had more, like, if he'd known ahead of time, I think he would have been even more careful about Gabriel escaping. Like, he would have had another plan in place because Gabriel escapes, but he could have not escaped if they'd had more, you know, preparation and stuff. And if he had known that Gabriel's escaping was not just disastrous politically, and but it was also disastrous for his baby, <laughs> it might have been. I mean, it's knowing that Gabriel has this final trump card to play, like, would have prepared him for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then we get Jenny Fleming being Jenny Fleming. Very in character. There she is. <laughs> there she is. And, uh, yeah. So, apparently she wants to make off with Lyman, which... To France. The fans are just like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. But yeah. Um, and then Janet uh, talks to Watt Scott. Oh, um, can I just mention really quick? I love how Jenny says Lyman introduced her once as to someone as the controller of the King's Beam last time we met. Yeah, which makes Margaret laugh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Margaret and Janet are completely different, but like, they've kind of got a, an interesting relationship, especially since Jenny here just flat out calls her dull child. Yeah. And like, it's not like out of enmity. I think it's like almost a term of endearment in this case. Yeah, and, and Margaret insults her mother. Um, mm -hmm. Jenny's, she's not bothered by it. Like they mm -hmm. love each other. Jenny, everything just is fine by her, you know? You know that their adult relationship ever since Margaret has become like even slightly like probably since Margaret was like an early teen has been Margaret trying to thwart Jenny and Jenny trying to get away. Like you just know that's been their entire their entire relationship. So this book really helped me repair my sort of feelings about Jenny Fleming. So I mean I still don't think she's the greatest, but like she comes a long way. I feel like she's just she's just flighty and bored you know and just wants attention and she's ready to have another french baby yeah she's not malicious and she's kind of funny yeah 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 like i don't think she's mean i think she's no. just bored and <laughs> and wants people to pay attention to her which yeah, yeah. a bit selfish but yeah and so yeah selfish um, um I like when we jump to um, the scene at Bryce's home where it says Janet Beaton had the whole matter strictly in hand. And you were talking about this, I think, Dean, like one of the last times we talked. Um, 
the way that like nothing happens with Watt that she's not aware of. And I love how this whole sequence just illustrates exactly what you were saying. Yeah, she's like, she just knows what to say to him. And like, and the only reason that the plan to assassinate him worked is because she wasn't with him. Like if, if Janet had, it's because he was somewhere, like she was off somewhere else running there, you know, doing something with a different family or something. And if she had been there, there's no way this would have worked. Like, I feel like Janet would have, like, she just would have known and, or she would have at least sent some men with him or something like, uh, yeah. But yeah, she does like she mentions it a little bit and then she waits a little bit and then she mentions it again, <laughs> waits a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, and then like at a certain point, he just starts treating it as fact, even though he yelled at her about it the first few times. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> it's like she's so good. <laughs> but uh, and and uh, I just like them a lot together. You know, I know. But, and Donnie clearly loved writing them, and it's mm -hmm. so sad that they're not together anymore because he's yeah. Yeah. well, she couldn't revise history. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. So then Jarrett goes back to St. Gabriel's. I mean, to uh, St. Mary's. St. <laughs> <And then laughs> Gabriel's. What was that at the time? Um, St. Mary's. And uh, there was this thing where he says, um, so he wants to save Graham Mallet to give Gabriel the chance no one had given his sister. And I'm like, really? No one? Yeah. But, and yet to keep his implicit promise to Lyman, he must do it without betraying what he knew or how close the hounds were to Gabriel's heels. And when I read that, I was like, oh, he's definitely gonna betray this. It was like, there's no way, there's no way that Gabriel is not gonna see through him in a heart, like in an instant. But it seems like he kind of pulled it off. Yeah, he pulled it off. Yeah. I think because so, the, okay. Because one weakness is underestimating his opponents. He doesn't know that they're all out to get him. He doesn't know that Lyman has exposed him to all these people. He doesn't even know that Lyman knows all the evil stuff he's done. Yeah. No, so, so anyway, I was I was proud of Jarrett for not screwing this up because <laughs> as soon as I read that sentence, I was like, oh no, this is gonna be terrible. He's gonna completely give it away. And he didn't. So it just blows my mind that Gabriel still thinks that his manipulation of Lyman has worked with no hitches. Well, except for, you know, the couple times where his plans have gone wrong. But that was mostly Jolita's fault, according to Gabriel. Yeah, Lyman did a really good job this whole time of not letting Gabriel become aware of what he knew. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Jarrett, I guess, has a better acting ability than Richard. <laughs> yeah, well, Richard has none, so I guess. Just a little bit. Richard managed to keep Taddy Boy a secret. In That's true. That is true. You're right, you're right. <laughs> you're right. But um, so on 572, we have this moment where um, he says, uh, there's nothing wrong with Francis Crawford's sense of the major moralities and a good deal that is admirable. Whereas, so he's changing his mind. Whereas in Gabriel, he recognized sickeningly at last a power for evil effortlessly sustained, which could come only from a mind totally warped. So he had been wrong and Lyman right. The task of returning Grand Mallet to the light of grace was the dream of a fool. So there we go. <laughs> Comes around in the end. Um, Finally. I Finally. <laughs> I like that what predicates that is the scene where Gabriel's refusing to call off the hounds that he sent after him and he twists the whole thing around into he is sick. Don't deny him the healing he needs. Mm -hmm. It's just so, so creepy the way he can just twist anything and justify like torturing someone as healing and oh, you know, it just makes your skin crawl. Yeah, yeah, boy. So then he goes, um, he goes on this walk with Nicholas and basically just hears Gabriel's whole plan, which was really, I feel like lovely for us to get it all laid out for us. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, we learn a lot more about what Gabriel was doing behind the scenes in the Malta section. I was gonna say, that's what you, you were like, when are we gonna get the expose of what happened in Malta? Here we go. Yeah, yeah. it was gonna come eventually, so. Yeah. 
So it was great. Um, the scene that I really, really, really want to go back and read again, and I actually almost did right here at this point, I almost just quit reading this chapter and went back to read the other part, is the wall scaling in Medina scene where Gabriel's going over the wall and Lyman goes after him. And um, that is definitely, like, I am definitely headed back to that scene because <laughs> because here, um, and I, I, th I think I vaguely remember that we thought the note was fishy or something that we had a question about it. I can't, I can't remember how much we knew it. Oh, I said something like, you know, the ones, the English side was convincing. The Turkish side was more forceful still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The omniscient narrator there is like really playing with words, but like, okay, more forceful in being convincing. Yeah. Real is evil, I guess. Yeah. And I can't remember if we, if we suspected that the, the Turkish side said something else or not. You did. But, um, we did? I can't remember. Um, yeah, so like I remember being suspicious of that whole scene though, but I definitely wasn't sure. So one of the really interesting lines in that scene also is Francis Crawford couldn't bring himself to acknowledge the meaning of the note or of his own malicious intent, um, which is written to make you think like questionable thoughts about Lyman but it also, if you read it accurately, then it actually means that Lyman at that point can't fully acknowledge how evil Gabriel is and how much he wants to take him down. And it's not until the scene in the tent that he really decides, okay, I'm gonna have to devote my life to stopping this guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we do get and we do get also this sense of like what gabriel had planned for lyman and why like like gabriel also has like plan a and plan b and plan c and plan d you know and so like plan a is for lyman to have a revolt against uh the grand master maybe die you know kill him or whatever and then exactly. plan b is uh scotland and like have you know is he going to do all this stuff in scotland which is what ends up coming to pass and then you know plan c is like well he's useful because he can tell me about dragoot and all that stuff and so there's just all of this mental you know these mental rings upon rings of what he's planning that yeah. well and there's this line um that lyron was just one of merely one of many gambits our friend sir graham was playing um so he even like beyond the scope of the stuff we see in this book, God only knows like who else he was manipulating and what else he was doing to just like plant all these seeds that he could. Like, yeah, like riled up the Calabrian boys and all of that. I'm absolutely sure. I don't think it makes it clear, but I'm sure that he was spending a lot of the um, treasury money that got blamed on Juan de Jomedes. I mean, Juan de Jomedes is still an awful person. But. No, I don't think so because it talks about how he's super mad because Jomedes is uh, gutting the force that he wants to control. And so like the reason he's so mad at Jomedes is because he's embezzling all this money and Gabriel wants it. Yeah. And and like he's he's gonna, if Gabriel takes over the knights, he's gonna take over this like empty force that doesn't have money or power anymore because of Jomedes and he's really mad about it. Mm -hmm. So... So that's why he leaves and decides, well, I'll just go do this army in Scotland thing. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Plan A is to take over the knights because the position of the head of the knights is like a very powerful position equivalent with like the monarchs, I think it says. Yeah. Um, so he doesn't want it to be decimated. He wants it to be powerful. So he's watching Wanda Omedes like, you know, lose all this power of the knights. And he's like, damn it, I want to take all this over and you're losing it. Yeah. Well, and that's why he gets so angry when Lyman calls him out and says like, you can't be the new leader. It's like, who would you replace Tom Hamidius with? You? It's like, nobody's, you know. And that's one of the few places where his face goes red. You know, we discussed whether he was embarrassed or angry about it. Yeah, right. yeah. Because like, oh, it should be Valette. John de la Valette. And like, uh, he was like, you barely even talked to him. Yeah. How come you didn't say me? <laughs> um, I also like Nicholas and Nicolay's description. Um, this is a true prince of darkness. Is it? Is he not a man worthy of fear? Like there's some hyperbole in here, but it's fun. Like she's like, I'm gonna make a super villain and she does it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just things like Gabriel so innocently opened the note, which was super suspicious back then anyway. Like that was not, that was not innocent. Um, 
but also this idea that uh, Mr. Crawford was not to be a victim of Juan de Jimenez, that, that actually Gabriel helped him get out of the hospital to some extent because he was to be a bright little tool in the brazen fingers of Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Lyman doesn't like being a tool. So. Yeah. <laughs> Unsurprising that he's not happy about this situation. Yeah. Um, there's also, if you, when you reread it, there's the scene where um, Lyman says, what you need is an assassin, but I am not the man. Mm -hmm. um, and then when De Nicola explains, like this whole time, Gabriel's been trying to get Lyman to assassinate the guy. And this is Lyman saying like, in some way, it's almost like, I know you want me to kill him and I'm not going to. Right. Yeah. yeah what you really need is an assassin, but not this guy. Because really <laughs> when, when he said that, like the first time I read it, I was like, that's a non sequitur. Nobody was talking about assassins. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> then you see all the way Gabriel's like, oh, Mondro Modus is causing all this terrible stuff to happen, you know, and he's totally trying to rile up an insurrection and an assassination. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and then I do kind of love that. Um, so it talks about Nicholas as compassionate. So it says like compassionately, the little man watched him. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's, he's struggling. He's saying like, how could he guess more than any of us could what Gabriel was? So, so Jared's just like so frustrated that Lyman figured out that Gabriel's evil and he was just bamboozled completely. And Nicholas does, like he's got compassion, but he doesn't really let him off the hook, which I liked as well. Cause he's just like, didn't you realize that like if he had actually been the person that he was pretending to be that different things would have been happening, you know? And yeah. And he didn't, so. um, there was one bit that you guys missed that I was surprised you missed actually. Oh, I know we missed stuff. Um, which was, um, you thought you and the Citadel, did you not that an escaping renegade, renegade had betrayed that the-, the Oh, weekend. right. Um, yeah yeah he was killed before he could speak that's actually in the in the book there's a reference to that guy having been killed before he arrived and talked so uh -huh. everyone the one that betrayed it but it's actually not him who could it have been oh no who could it have been yeah yeah so <sighs> there's one bit in here though that i didn't i still don't get which is the thing about the letter from una that gabriel had opened Mm -hmm. like, is there an implication that she didn't write it or just that he like extra made sure that it got delivered where what where he innocently opened the letter is that what you're talking about it's 575 um uh you may remember a note from mistress o'dwyer carefully delivered which gabriel had so innocently opened mm -hmm. um, and in that note she told him don't come i don't want to see you but right like I interpret that as a real note and that she really didn't want him to come. And that is James. Right. Wrote. Yeah. And you yourself were instrumental, I believe in preventing him at Gabriel's request from crossing to Gozo where he might either. I think it's just the implication that Gabriel found out about the note and is sort of like manipulated Jarrett into continue. Like it's all these things to keep Lyman from going over there. So Gabriel knew about it and or maybe it was the key for how he could manipulate Una because maybe it helped him realize her like low self-esteem and her belief that he uh -huh. could rescue her because it would hurt him. I mean, it was just more information about their relationship, which he used Ugh. for ill. I hate what he did to Una more than like anything. I know. I know. And then we talk about, speaking of Una, um, Nicholas is like, I don't know. Um, and I can discover no one who knows where the baby is. And so Nicholas has clearly tried to find Una and the baby and can't. Um, well, and the ending of the sequence is shocking. Pray if you still have faith in prayer that the baby is dead. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Nobody wants to rescue this poor baby. <laughs> right. I mean, I kind of read that as, um, I can't find, like, I've tried to find this baby and I can't. And what I'm imagining is happening to the baby is bad. So if yeah. you believe in prayer, pray that the baby is dead because alive, this child being alive will be horribly mistreated. 
And that's kind of how I read that. Not so much that like we wish the baby was dead, but that this is bad. Yeah, that's how I read it. The baby is definitely not dead, so. Um, but I, yeah. like, I think also there's an interesting part where Nicolay says, shall I tell you why Lyman first began to hate, to hate Mark you, your monastic friend? It was when whatever haven he offered them overnight, Grand Mallet allowed to return all the women and children of Gozo. And Jared says, well, he couldn't have prevented it. Um, and Nicolay says, um, he doesn't dispute that. Lyman doesn't dispute that. He says merely that if Gabriel were all he appeared to be, he should have died on the landing stage. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that, like, for a couple of reasons. One, it's like, oh yeah, you know, that actually makes perfect sense. Like Gabriel talks this talk, but he doesn't walk the walk in terms of all these heroic things. Um, but also the fact that Lyman hates Gabriel so much, I think is a, a weakness in Lyman that probably makes him question himself because part of him is probably like, is it, is he really as evil as I think, or am I just distracted mm -hmm. by how much I hate him? Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the like decision he has to struggle over in the tent. Mm -hmm. It's like, is this just like, is he really as dangerous as I think he is? Or do I just hate him this much? Or am I just so angry because he's like, he Person. allowed all these women and children to die and various other things, but yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, and I mean, I think it's easy for Gabriel to, it was easy for him in the nights to like blame the things that he wanted to do on the Jimenez, you know, like blame the evil that he wanted to commit as I was following orders and then hide the other evil that he wanted to commit in other ways. And He uh, always has something to cover up every single thing that he does. Like, I don't think he makes a move to an action if he can't figure out a way to foist it off on someone else. Yeah. Yeah, his shock in the next chapter is just kind of delightful to witness. Like, just how shocked he is that, like, he can't get away with it. Like, and then he's, he's sort of using this, he's using all of the tools of like oration and his looks and he's standing tall with his gold hair, like glistening in the church and he's speaking and, and the people are just like, mm, no, here's the evidence. And he's so mad. It's interesting. Cause I sort of think in real life, I'm very cynical in real life. It probably, probably a lot of people probably would have still been supporting him. Um, but it is so narratively satisfying to have all these people be like, no, we don't believe you anymore. Yeah. 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 If only that worked in real life. I know. <sighs> yeah. Um, and then Jarrett, God bless him. The man cannot do anything by halves. <laughs> and decides like, I'm renouncing my place in the order. <laughs> um, yeah, but I did, I actually did like, um, I love the bit where, wait, is it here? Oh yeah, it is. Where Lyman says like that he and Gabriel, one thing he and Gabriel have in common is to strip him of his religion. And Jarrett says no. And I really, I really like this about Jarrett actually. I will give him some props here where <laughs> he says, um, you have shown me between you that I have no claim to be more than a limping novice on that journey. The order requires more than I have to give. And I, and I like that idea that he's acknowledging that he doesn't know, like he has faith, but he doesn't know about his faith. And I think just historically, like the problem that people have with faith is that they start pontificating about, I know all the things, you know? And it's like, it's like when you become the expert in the religion and start, speaking from a place of power that it becomes problematic and so Jarek's like no I'm, I'm leaving the order and I am a novice in this and I was like okay good for you <laughs> um, and then we have that amazing moment where Jarek says he's gonna leave and then decides to stay with Lyman yeah um and, and I love the way like Lyman wishes him, you know, Godspeed you to France. He wishes him a goodbye. And then he makes this kind of uh, cool comment, how, impeach how unimpeachably shifty it sounds. What a fate for the tongues of the world that after Gabriel, all that is true and simple and scrupulous should sound like primeval ooze. Um, so we get this kind of like 
com comparison of Gabriel's over the top, you know, saintly blah, blah, blah. And then like Lyman who is a real person and can't perfectly express what he's genuinely feeling. Um, but a little enough of his real emotion does come through that it like changes Jared's entire plan. Um, and he has this like intense emotional response. This brought Jared's whole mechanism for speech, emotion and deed to a shuddering halt. Mm. Um, and it's and it's he hears what Lyman is suppressing. Uh, a little of the warmth he was suppressing showed through despite his effort. Yeah, and then Cr Francis Crawford. And again, you get that, his name, you know, it's like, oh God, Jared said Francis Crawford and the blood rose revealingly to in his colorless face. Yes, but oh Christ, I am glad. If you touch my back again, you'll have to see the whole bloody thing through yourself. What that tells you is like, Jared is touching his back. He's put his arm around him or he's hugging him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're hugging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm so glad, stop touching me. <laughs> but it's so sweet. Like this is like the most genuine emotion we get out of Lyman in a positive way in this whole book. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, And then, and then do we want to move on? Are yep. we good? Okay. Yeah, so then um, uh, Tosh dies, which is a little sad. So it's like we just, and he, he kind of dies sort of like Gideon died, where it was just like, and he died, and then we move on. <laughs> and you're like, oh. But. Dorothy um, Dunn is not sentimental. Yeah, but the key here is that Tosh was the was standing in between Baklu and murder, and then he was murdered. Obviously, the implication is he was murdered thwarting an attempt to kill Watt Scott. Mm -hmm. And so now there's nothing standing between. Yeah, I mean, he's got some ineffectual guards, but they're not, they're not that great. So, and he's gone to Edinburgh. So I, I love how Lyman's like, Edinburgh, okay, we're going to go. Like, I, I'm going to go like immediately and starts making all these plans. And Jared's like, you're not going. You're not going. <laughs> And it's like Jared has completely like flipped a switch now and he's like trying to be like super protective of Lyman. And it's so cute. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't work, but it's so cute. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. And and Lyman is just determined that another blue clue is not gonna die as a result of this, which, oh, sad. Well, this was his whole thing in Queen's play. Like I cannot deal with people dying because of me. I know. It's really not because of you, it's because of Gabriel in this case, but like. He's yeah everybody and so they make these plans and send all these people out and i love this image at the end or it's like they burst apart on their various errands like a furlot of lentils which i don't quite know what a furlot is but i had this image of like a, just lentils just being like whoosh, like tossed it's like they all go different directions do their thing and um then they ride without respite or concealment straight into the net which is a really good end to a chapter yeah, they ride into the net, but they have all their plans. Yeah. Got their oh. revelations. Yeah, and then this final chapter is basically, it's a pretty simple chapter in the sense of what happens. Like, what Scott is set upon and murdered. Everyone sort of thinks, you know, it's, it's trying to capture Lyman. They have this showdown. He leads Gabriel into the church. They have a showdown in the church. They have a fight in the church. Gabriel escapes like they Gabriel tells him about his son Gabriel escapes so that's kind of the summary of the chapter but um oh good scenes so uh so on this read I skipped Buckley's death because two reasons one it's horrible and I don't want to read it um two it's full of historical like historically accurate detail about how Buckley really died um which is interesting the first time around, but not really relevant to the story. So not yeah. reread. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I read all the way through it, but it was basically just a bunch of like, he ran here and other people were here and then they were in this place and then <laughs> and then they stabbed him here. And then... it, it makes sense because yeah. he's such an important character that you, you want this whole like, wait, how did this happen to him? Um, but yeah, it's horrible read. Yeah, I'm glad his death was not just a like, Oh, he came around the corner and they stabbed him. Like, I mean, I'm glad it was 
like it it was worthy of the character like the story of, of how he died but um but oh so sad and that that bit where like they rode right by him and didn't realize he was there and just oh almost the worst of it yeah it's like because he'd still only been stabbed once i think at that point and could have yeah. been saved i don't think he could have i think no this- it said it was a mortal wound mm-hmm. but it just wasn't immediately mortal so. he could have at least like died with friends comforting him instead of yeah. Yeah. a greeting way yeah oh yeah so then we get this scene where Graham comes upon Lyman over the body. And so he's sort of like trying to manipulate everyone around him into capturing Lyman and, you know, blaming him for, for the death. And then he says like, I doubt he'll reach the toll booth, the prison alive. So obviously they're going to try and he's trying to manipulate matters so that Lyman dies quickly um, here in Edinburgh. And so how are they going to avoid that? Well, I think the creepiest part of that is how he comes upon Jarrett and he comes this close to murdering Jarrett right there. And it's only because like other people come, come mm-hmm. around the corner or whatever. Yeah. And he doesn't murder him. Yeah. Um, and this like the, the way he appears, because we're in Jarrett's point of view. So the Chevalier Blythe came face to face with a massive shadow standing silent in the gaping back of the stall. The shadow of a tall man whose white plume stirred in the night air and whose cuirass glinted bright like his own under the long black robe starred on the shoulder of a grand cross of the Order of St. John. So this idea of him as a shadow and this like terrifying, like again, this like he's got this over the top evil, like he is Satan, you know? Um, super, super scary. And then he's he yeah. about to kill Jarrett. Um, another interesting thing when you reread is looking at the light imagery used with Gabriel, like the shadows. Um, there's a couple of times when he comes into the tent when they're in Tripoli where it's like, and then a shadow blocked out the sun. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, um, yeah, he just, it, and it's interesting the way that he's so often overtly described with like all this golden imagery, you know, like his hair is shining like gold and, and he's, um and yet there's yeah and yet he's blocking the sun and he's and he's this big like there's so many descriptions of him as like this giant of a man this big guy and so then he's he's just threatening anytime that's mentioned because he's so physically overwhelming and uh yeah I like also that Jared has this moment of relief that he's not in the party coming after Lyman to get him because he like was this close to still being anti-Lyman and being on Gabriel's side during this yeah so then we're in the church well and just as they go in this this um Jarrett and Gabriel walk in together and Gabriel puts his hand on the tendons of Jarrett's neck ah, it's so, oh it's so creepy yeah shall we go in and guide his soul to take the true selfless course Ooh, like does he still think that this is working oh yeah like but he just was gonna kill Jarrett so like, I mean, the hand on Jarrett's neck is a threat. So I think he must have realized to some extent that Jarrett's loyalty is flipping back to Lyman a little bit. I'm not sure how he figured it out. Maybe just that like Jarrett was there with Lyman. Because mm-hmm. um, yeah, he was about to kill him and he didn't kill him when he had the chance at St. Mary's. So something has changed. Like the fact that Jarrett left St. Mary's and now he's showing up with Lyman, I think Gabriel knows that he's lost Jarrett in some way and better, yeah. better to kill him. And he's leading him to the church because this is when Gabriel's finally going to get Lyman. He's like, this is the denouncement. Like, this is where it ends. So I want you to be front row center to watch me destroy him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you guys want to see some pictures of St. Giles? Yes, please. We're about to go into this description of the church, which sounds beautiful. And it is indeed. All right. I was hoping you'd have images of the church. I just Google image it. I didn't, these aren't my own, but um, they're probably better than mine anyway. But yeah, so when you're in like the main part of Edinburgh, this is um, wow. a big- You know what? I was in this church and what? I didn't realize that this was the church because I've been what? in Edinburgh, but I didn't know. Yeah. This is like, yeah, it's like the main church you go to. Yeah, I've definitely been in here. Ooh. All right. It oh, is wow, beautiful. That's it's beautiful. so beautiful inside. Wait, yeah, click on that one. Oh, gorgeous. 
what a great um, location for a mega fight scene. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine this being filmed? Oh my gosh. I'm honestly so surprised it never has been. I think it would be really hard. It keeps getting options. Like I think there is actually a script that was being written a couple years ago, but I don't know if they're ever going to really make it. I mean, I think any film series these days would lose a lot of the nuance of the books. Yeah. HBO should take it on as a TV series. Yeah, let's not have the guys that do Game of Thrones involved in it, please. Yeah, no, not the Game of Thrones guys. Nope. <laughs> Maybe stars or, I don't know. I Amazon feel like Prime. We'll see how Amazon Prime does with Wheel of Time. Maybe they would be okay. I honestly think the Game of Thrones is such a disaster at the end that like it really hurts the chances of other similar things being made. But Or at least things that aren't written yet. I feel like that's the lesson of Game of Thrones is don't do a project if you don't know the end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. has an end. Yeah, we know. We, I mean, we don't know the end, but there is an end to this. So and it has a fandom. So if the end didn't completely destroy everyone's love of it. Well, that's good. Yeah. All right. Okay. Into the church. Into the church. Into the church. Into the church. Um. I just totally lost my place because I shut my book when I was looking at the pictures of St. Giles. 591. <laughs> what page it's are we on? 591. Okay. All right. Yes. Into the church. So we have this description of the church, which we just saw. Um, <laughs> I love this. Come and let us inspire the great Greek St. Giles to cast the demons from us all. <laughs> oh um so yeah so you have this confrontation what parts of the confrontation do you want to well first of all i like how gabriel's like there's no way this is happening and then he um he he's like the young man is losing his mind i have known it for some time i myself will stand surety for his behavior and with holy church's help will give him the nursing he needs it's like oh. So creepy, so creepy, so creepy, and he keeps saying these things like, "I'm gonna nurse him," and like, "Don't, don't stop him from getting the help he needs." And it's like, the help he needs is like you planning to horribly murder him, you creep. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't work, which is nice. Like, because you can, you can see, you can imagine the situation where he's able to manipulate the manipulate the crowd. And like I said, in the real world, I think he would totally get away with it. Well, I think even before that, it's interesting that the first sort of notion that Gabriel gets that something else might be happening here. Like maybe I underestimated things is when uh, James Sandilin shows up. Cause it's like beside Jarrett, Sir Graham Mallet became very still. It's like the first time he's realizing, wait a second, what did I just walk into? Yeah, and then Lyman reveals that he's got this prearranged thing to like mm -hmm. Graham Mallet here and now. So like yeah. Lyman went running into the church for a reason. It wasn't just like, I'll be run to a place of refuge. It was like the whole plan the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And I also, I like the little bit where it says um, the, he turned, so the first bunch of familiar faces, Adam Blacklock with a hooded girl on his arm, period. Philippa, period. <laughs> I love that she comes in. Lyman has the part earlier about should we bring Philippa? Yeah, let's bring Philippa. Yeah, definitely bring Philippa. Yeah. <laughs> and she's definitely important. She put in a lot of effort into saving his life. I like her more and more, by the way. I'm definitely, I'm, okay, I'm not definitely sure because I don't know for sure, but she could die unexpectedly in chapter one of the next book. But I do think that that this story is heading headed for something with Lyman and Philippa. I oh, think. you're so right. I, I can't imagine that it's not like the way that she's written and the way that she keeps coming up and she's so practical and like she's willing to speak to Lyman even if she's wrong like she's willing to speak truth to Lyman but sometimes she's wrong <laughs> but but you know that she that I don't know I just think she's getting shaped into a character that is his match in this way so yeah we'll see we'll see but I will be a little bit sad if that doesn't happen. <laughs> At least it wasn't Jolita. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know why I just don't want him with her. That's a horrific thought. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I love in this section is all the names that um, Gabriel calls Lyman. Like throughout the books, it's just hilarious to me. Um, so I will just read them as we get to those parts. Um, okay. The first one being 
this animal in spangles, this bright, malicious harlot, this furious and fatuous young man. He just cracks me up. Like, I know he's super evil, but he's really funny sometimes. He's, he's super dramatic. Like, he's, he's super evil, but he's super dramatic, so. Um, yeah, and, and then we just kind of have this litany of charges against Gabriel. I don't know if we want to go through all of them whatever you think is interesting to talk about um um i think it, it's interesting to see i thought i think the thing that i thought was interesting was not so much all the charges but just gabriel's responses to all the charges so like like at the point where um lyman mentions like uh, Madame Donati denouncing him. And so he's like, Evangelista, crazed by the death of my sister. What kind of witnesses are these? In any case, we have no need of them. We all know how Will Scott came to die. So he's like, and they don't matter anyway. Here's this thing. Will Scott died at it. You know, and it's just like, obviously these tactics have, tactics have worked in the past, but it's not working now. What these remind me of is like online conspiracy theories. He takes a whole bunch of facts that are not necessarily related to each other and he draws a cause and effect that isn't there and he's like this and this and he got his mistress to seduce the governor of gozo clearly he's trying to take down like the night you know and just all this stuff that's co complete like real facts but completely fake right, like, right, right. connections between them and like and, and, it's an and also thing, how in the battle only james up or nicholas upton died and of course he was right next to lyman so how did he really die let's throw some cast some aspersion on that this is literally like it, this the whole thing is such a parallel for the way politics work now in like the internet age it's amazing to me that she wrote this in the 60s about the 15 you know 50s yeah. um, but it's still very very applicable to human psychology yeah and there's also like these connections that are drawn that are not connected <laughs> you know like let's just say there's this thing and then but what also the what about ism like you know just that's that's the thing that really drives me nuts about conspiracy theories and stuff today is people are like you you talk you like you're having a discussion about something and then someone will pop in with like but what about this other thing that's completely unrelated <laughs> which is what he's doing right here with this will scott business it's like in any way that doesn't matter because we all know how will scott died and it's like we're not talking about will scott right now <laughs> you know so yeah yeah oh. and it's like but if you want to talk about will scott let's talk about how will scott died okay. um yeah there's a couple of interesting bits um jared thought he was being followed but it was actually um tosh following uh gabriel right um, which is interesting because i think we talked about it when Jared has this like he was having me followed mm -hmm. and we were like why was Lyman having him followed and it's like oh he wasn't having Jared followed at all yeah yeah should have seen that one yeah, but, uh, yeah we should have seen that one I love when Janet comes in and she's just hey you have a friend you really <laughs> wants to sit on my lap so <laughs> we can pause for kittens I don't know keep talking um but I love when Janet comes in and she's just grief stricken and has just come from seeing the like mutilated body of her husband who she deeply loves like you know yeah. all of their bickering aside like they they were devoted to each other and she has come from seeing his body and just lays out the whole hot trod thing and how will died and and it because it's her speaking there's just no coming there's no coming back from that like yeah, it, yeah. best witness she could have yeah mm -hmm. and everyone knows like how much she loves love Watt and all that yeah and um, she even mentions that little bit where gabriel took the money and papers from george paris like that had to have been from the river when he like got his cloak and he was like oh look what's this <laughs> that was not an accident um, so there's a moment where like, you know, things are going against Gabriel and um, he realizes his defeat. And there's this line, um, Jarrett Blythe saw Gabriel draw himself up as he seldom did to his full magnificent height, which I think she is almost the same line um, earlier in the whipping scene, but it's such an effective line that I don't mind. Cause it's like, he's like this super powered super villain basically who kind of hides that and then like here he's like letting it out like oh i really am a super villain i'm not gonna hide it anymore i'm just gonna annihilate you all yeah and then he says something which i think is just 
so illustrative of his character, which is, um, you have just cost me, I believe, quite an excessive amount of my time. I shall be interested to pursue the matter with you on some other occasion. And he's like, he's so mad because it's not about his sister's death. It's not about like all this carnage or anything else. It's like, you've wasted my time. We're gonna like, you know, and you will pay for that. And it's just like, whoa, like the sociopath. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He literally can't fathom that anyone else matters at all. Only Mm -hmm. in the whole world that matters is him. And he thinks he's so wonderful and so great. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There was something, I think it, maybe it was back when Nicholas and Jarrett were having the discussion. I'm not sure, but there's a point where someone talks about how like he's not doing this for a dynasty. Like he's not doing this for all these reasons. He just wants personal power. Like it's not. I mean, he's going to kill his own sister, his only surviving family. Like, he, yeah, to protect himself because he only cares about himself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's got to know that he has a child out there somewhere. Jolita's first baby, right? Yeah, he should. Because he probably helped spirit it away wherever it is. Yeah, and and it goes beyond the the. It's beyond the bounds of believability that Jolita's baby is not his. Like, yeah. like I definitely think that's that's the case. So again, we have like two blonde babies wandering around somewhere like if gabriel bought uh una and the baby what is his name again kent caridin 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 i don't know how to pronounce it like yeah. usual caridin from um Garo. then are the are these two little kids being raised together like did he put them in the same space like that would be interesting if that was happening hmm but the other baby's like definitely older at least by a year or two at least by a year or two yeah Hmm. topic for another book i'm sure okay uh back to this so we have the sociopath in the church (laughs) um Oh. There's a great moment where um, he calls on Desor, who's been like his most loyal guy, and he gives this speech, um, Antichrist is here, I can do no more against him or against these poor souls who malign me, give me your hand, come with me, add your great spirit and your prayers in my blah blah blah, absolve me, beseech thee, oh lord, absolve this blah blah blah, just this blah blah blah, then when you read it, it's like this doesn't make any sense, like this is just total mm-hmm. like, bullshit that he's just babbling these like key words that have like a religious you know significance in this religion and trying to get the religious you know knights to like go with him yeah it's absolute it's nonsense. Not. um and the thing that makes me really sad is that in the real world this stuff works it would have worked <sighs> Sorry. yeah it's, just, it's so sad and that <laughs> i love this where the chevalier is like he just, um, he just says, Sir Graham, in the name of justice, we believe you must stay and answer these charges. We cannot in conscience join you or follow you now. It's like, well, that has been. And then Graham Mallet is just, he just loses it, so loses powerful. it. Yeah. And like must, on a note no one present had heard before, must fool fat God sodden blunderer, which well, that gives your his opinion of, of them. There's nothing Graham Mallet must do except clear the lice from his path. Yep. Also, another moment is his face turning red, where, again, like we were wondering before, is that embarrassment? No, that's his absolute, like he's so enraged. That's like the one tell that he can't hide is his face turning red. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I love though that he does end up in the situation where he reveals to everyone how evil he is and he's not hiding it at all anymore. He's just like, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he stabs a priest in a-, a Yeah, priest. he stabs a total he, he doesn't care anymore. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah. Um, yeah, so then they have this fight, basically. Okay, so um, I love Lyman's- um, like then like some chill peri-astral missile Lyman launched himself from the altar rails. 
Yeah. And uh, the ambassador's like, nope, just let him fight it out. <laughs> you know, like, oh, mm -hmm. really? Um, yeah. Is he still trying to protect Gabriel at this point? Is there something going on? Because yes, he does put the line of the, the soldiers around the fight to sort of keep anybody from interfering. He's protecting something because he deliberately lets Gabriel get away. Like yeah. there, there's the thing that is later in the chapter when it's talking about Gabriel's escape where it's like this guy, he moved too slowly. And the implication is he did it on purpose. Like he moved too slowly here at the church and he moved too slowly chasing him. So he was able to both escape the church and catch a ship. And it's the fault of the French. Yeah. These French I think guys. It seems like that was the implication. That there's the implication that if Gabriel gets caught that he'll give up something dirty about we sell as well because they they did you know spend a lot of time together while he was trying to get the queen dowager's influence behind it so more about the queen dowager he has been bribing her that what it could be that he he it could be Ozell is operating under instructions from the queen dowager mm -hmm. ariel has been bribing her mm -hmm. yeah sure. yeah there, there's and, a and lot about the whole george paris cormac o'connor insurance scam that i still don't quite understand that's sort of coming to light in this chapter as well so i mean i don't think it's not it's i think it's a simple scam it's just yeah. not important like it's just a thing that's happening but history because it's part of the motivation for buckley's death uh, i'm not sure maybe I mean, it seems like something that would historically happen. Like it still happens today. Like you insure something and then somehow it gets destroyed and then you collect the insurance, but you still have the thing. Like people do that. So um, it's a time honored scam. So going back to the awesomely hilarious evil thing that Gabriel calls Lyman, um, we have sweet hot blooded creature. I had no idea you had a brain. You should have joined me. I would have made you a little prince. Creepy. Um, and then he says, come my flower, no one will interfere. Uh, <laughs> no good, no good. Um, yeah, and then, and then he stabs the priest. Yeah. Oh my God. Sir, you meddle. Oh, and then Randy comes out and throws a wrench into the works. Well, and the whole thing is so evil after. too, because because Gabriel's just trying to get Randy killed um, and weaken Lyman by having him spend time fighting Randy. Like he doesn't in any way expect Randy to survive. No, and Randy doesn't have a choice because if he gets captured, he's going to hang. Like obviously, so he's just kind of throws himself into the fray and uh, hoping that Gabriel will help him escape, which of course he has no intention of doing. Which ugh, yeah. Uh, so then we have the revelation of the scar on Gabriel's oh. chest. Yeah. I guess very early on. Um, and there's a line on 603. Uh, Why so prim, sweeting? Surely Evangelista told you. What for Trotty, the sisters of whatever might have had a rare child to nurture. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we not knew this whole time that Gabriel was having sex with his, like, how old was she, 12 when it started? Sister. And, like, she didn't, I mean, admittedly, she was in a position where if she tried to go against him, he probably would have just killed her. And then Jolita wouldn't have had anybody. So she probably just was like, I'm going to do what I can to protect Jolita. But, like, yeah. she, lady, you should have tried to reveal him somehow. Do something. Yeah. Yeah, Ugh, it's just awful. Um, yeah, I mean, it, to be kind of dark, I could actually imagine her trying something and failing and Gabriel just holding it over her head and mocking her and being like, you know, and enjoying the power of like statistically hurting his sister and this woman and like, I could totally see that happening. But, uh, yeah. So we find out that we and Lyman and everyone find out that, yes, as suspected, Gabriel has been molesting his sister. 
Um, I mean, I do love how completely over the top evil Donut makes him. Like, she clearly was just like, my villains haven't been evil. <laughs> what is the most evil that I can possibly think of? So evil. <laughs> it's hard about this because she makes him so evil. Yeah. She, I mean, I can't imagine. Like, I guess he was a cannibal. That would be more evil. But I mean, you don't know he wasn't. Maybe he was. Like, he's the most evil. Um, I do think this is such an interesting line where um, uh, Lyman says, um, uh, "There's no certainty in your sword. There's no escape at the end. You're fighting for your pride, but I haven't done what I've done to die here under your blade. Only a fool, mallet, or a man losing his mind." makes the same mistake twice. It was deliberately done, and this is Jarrett's perspective. It was deliberately done, no doubt. It touched Jarrett saw on what was probably the only fear that Gabriel knew. So as much as I distrust Jarrett's perspective and his read on everything, um, that does make sense that, that Graham, like the only thing that he fears is himself, that, that his own brain like becoming you know, somehow going crazy or, or losing his mental faculties in some way. Yeah, because all he cares about is himself. Right. If you were to right. Use that capability of, you know, manipulating everything and getting whatever he wants. It's the scariest thing. And he probably does have some concept of like, I'm not like other people. Yeah. Um, my brain is so much smarter and better, but like maybe something went off the rails. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that makes it fragile. Do you, what is this thing that he says? Do you, do you know that? The Abatek Unnet Mahab Fil Dunya. I don't I know. I've done it, companion, but I have a cat on my lap. Sorry. Oh, okay. Tell us later. Um, I'll post it in the description. If I yeah, like. post it in the description. Whatever it was he says. I can look it up quick. Um, uh, or so, do you think that might be a spoiler? No, but the Donut Companion will have like uh, context. It's probably, it's yeah, like yeah. That's relevant to the story. It yeah. might be like a line in some poem from. I'm sure it is. The 13th. And it'll be like a line, like, and then like the next line is like relevant, but you can't. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he just, he's just like, you know, you, you're, you know, a true word, a loud a usurper heard without name. You would meddle with me. You would lay your half made hands on my life. Uh, yeah, it's just. I'm going to cut off your hands. Like Francis Crawford, who worships, I'm told, two things himself, power and music. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to sever your hands. It's it's like the, it's so over the top. It's it's like the, um, the speech from Princess Bride. Like it's not to the death, it's to the pain. Like, <laughs> about that, as I read this, I was like, I wonder if William Goldman read this before he wrote The Princess Bride, because there is several things in here that are like, so Princess Bride. Yeah, yeah. And the sword fight in the first book too. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So it literally means thy mother made thee unique in this world, so. Oh, okay. So we get the English translation right after it. Okay. Your editor must have been like, you got to stop throwing these things in. No one knows <laughs> People have not had this education. We don't do this anymore. Um, and then, and smiling still, he attacked. Like just, I mean, just this glee that he's got in. I, I mean, you just must imagine that it must, he must be enjoying like throwing off the disguise. And it's like, how dare you attack? You know, he's had to be so humble and, you know, fake penitent and all that stuff. And now it's just like, I am the, you know, whatever. <laughs> and like, he must be, you know, he's just like happy to be. Because he, he has to spend every like second of his life acting. So he yeah. does get to just like be himself a bit. Oh, yeah. Be yourself. <laughs> um, and then we get this, he makes the one mistake that he makes over and over and over, which is he underestimates his opponent. Yep. Um, and I love that we get Richard's looking at it because Richard knows how good with a sword lineman is. Oh, yeah. He sure does. Yeah, <laughs> he does. Um, their, um, their like wrestling battle and Jarrett thinking, um, you forgot that Lyman had not sailed the Mediterranean pacing the poop deck. He had been below in shackles where to exist, you had to fight like a cur. Mm -hmm. Which in addition to explaining how dirty this fight is, 
um, is a reminder of what an awful traumatic life Lyman has had. Yeah. He was so young. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a fight. And then there's phrases like using his splendid body, he arched. Just like we even, even through this fight, we get these reminders like these guys are handsome. <laughs> like, you know. Harry. It's where Gabriel gets a lot of his power. So it's like relevant to his yeah. story. But like the yeah. fact that Jared is super hot, which he also keeps reminding us, is like not relevant to the story. But. Right, right, right. <laughs> also, I mean, speaking of cinematic, like Gabriel's shirt has been torn off and he's got this scar. So he's like shirtless in this fight. And it's all like super beautiful and yet like grounded and dirty fight and all that. And it's like, this would definitely be the tent pole fight scene in a film. Yeah. It is a, it feels very, very cinematic. This is not yeah. an epic fight. Yep. Um and so, then, yeah. And, and then I love this bit where just people are calling out all of his crimes. Like your life is forfeit for this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And yeah. Um yeah. And then Gabriel pulls his trump card. Yeah. Uh, so sad. So he finds out, he tells him that he has a kid. He's a baby. And Nicholas confirms it. Um, yeah. Well, and so let's talk. There's so much to talk about here. Um, first of all, Lyman's reaction. And I love that it's Sibylla's point of view we get. Mm -hmm. uh, his face showed nothing but Sibylla, who knew him best, thought she saw his heart stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then just to rub it in, um, instead of blossoming in that careful, careless affection, which he had given already so endearingly to Kevin, and then instead this poor kid bought like an animal, branded like an animal, being bartered like some dirty, unconsidered coin for Gabriel's life. Um, and I love, I just love that turn of phrase, careful, careless affection, because they seem like opposite words, but they actually make perfect sense together in this context mm -hmm. yeah like he's very careful with kevin but he's careless with his like he's not he's not um protecting himself in his affection for kevin so it's like he's careful of kevin but he's just pouring out affection carelessly on kevin which uh, that scene when you first read it it's like oh it's so cute and now it's like no it's stabbing you in the heart <laughs> yeah like, oh. And then this bit where Sibylla says, um, uh, she saw Francis begin automatically to breathe again. And so just that idea that like he takes a breath, not because, like he only takes a breath because his body forces him to, mm -hmm. like his automatic nervous system makes him breathe, but otherwise like he stopped. Well, and then also for all his forced maturity and all his arts, Francis Crawford did not possess Gabriel's true impermeable mask to speak and smile and pray for him. The shock, the half-believing agony of mind showed now as he stared, shaken by the quiet force of his breathing, his brow lined at Gabriel's smiling, satisfied eyes. So like, I love that we're in this moment with Lyman and we see it through his mother's eyes. And so we will have no doubt how seriously he takes this and how devastated he is by it mm -hmm. um but then he makes this decision that it's worth killing gabriel even if it means una and the kid will die mm -hmm. what do you guys think of that i think i think he's i think it's heartbreaking like i think he's giving up the possibility of something he desperately wants and only found out he desperately wants a moment ago because Gabriel alive is so dangerous and so like it's like he's de he decided you know ages ago that to do all of this because Gabriel is so dangerous and that hasn't changed you know just because the stakes for him are higher and the stakes for him are more devastating it hasn't changed the fact that that this needed to be done and so uh, People really argue about this. Um, there's also an argument, I'm not saying what I think, but there's also an argument that his own, he, his loyalty should be to his son above all else. He should try to save the kid over killing Gabriel. 
I mean, maybe, but that's a selfish position to take. So if Lyman is unself, like, I think this scene shows him being unselfish in ways that, that it, like my kid is more important than everyone else's kids is a selfish position to take. Like, I mean, it's, it's a natural position to take. And like, of course people take that all the time and that's understandable to take that position, but it is at heart selfish. So for him to say no, that this goal to kill Gabriel is to rid the world of this evil is more important is a heartbreaking but noble choice. Yeah. I, I do think he, um, he, the decision is a logical decision based on like sort of ethical principles. Um, but I do think like the emotional reaction is I need to save my child. So it's interesting, like people keep calling him a machine and then here he makes what is very like that part of your brain, the logical part of your brain, the more mechanical part of your brain makes this decision. And he like puts aside that emotional instinct that he, we know he's having, mm -hmm. but he, he chooses not to go that direction. Yeah. And I, but I don't know. I don't know if I would say it, and maybe it was a logical decision. I don't think it was a mechanical decision. Like, I think it was a heartbreaking decision. And what that, mechanically? that what? I don't think he made it like in a mechanical way. No, and I don't think he made it without cost, without like a deep cost. And it's like, if he had killed Gabriel in this moment, he would never like, it would have ruined his life forever. Like there's no, he would never have been the same again. And yeah, like Gabriel would have killed him kind of and, and metaphorically in that, in that moment. So, and I think Philippa is the reader right here where like, she's, she's that like, no, don't do it. You have to save your kid, you know? <laughs> um, so we get that perspective here, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So that was my next question: is what you guys think about Philippa? She's saying, you know, what about all the potential of this child? Um, you know, you've caught Gabriel. Like, don't kill him. Let's let's just keep him in prison and save the kid. Yeah, yeah I think she's right on. She doesn't know he's going to escape at this point. So, like, yeah. this is definitely where the story should have gone. I would have been a little upset if Lyman had killed him, but just a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think Philippa is is all of us who are like, no, the baby, you know? Um, yeah. Was but it, I don't think, I don't think Lyman's choice to do that was morally wrong. I think what Philip is missing is that, is how incredibly dangerous Gabriel is alive. Exactly. Like, which I think is what Philippa has been missing the whole time. <laughs> like, like she just doesn't understand the consequences of of like she didn't understand the secret she didn't understand the consequences of that because she didn't understand Jolita and she didn't understand Gabriel so I think in this moment she also still doesn't understand Gabriel well she's also 13 so yeah, she's 13. Right. it's a very of course like save yeah. the child above all else yeah no shade to her like there's no reason that she would understand it necessarily so but I love how she not only does she like run in and just, like save the child but then when she sees her chance she crafts the knife out of out of Lyman's hands. Of course, then let's Gabriel get away. Yeah. Yeah. Philippa. But I love that for Philippa Sol Somerville, who believed in action when words were not enough. And you just get a sense, like, I feel like this is going to be a theme for her. <laughs> like, what is she going to do going forward where she just, like, stop talking, we're doing the thing? <laughs> like, is this going to come back? I feel like it is. So. Hopefully with a little more emotional maturity as she gets older. Hopefully, yeah, I hope so. I mean, she is, I mean, cause we keep having to remind ourselves that she's 13. So she is actually kind of mature for a 13 year old um, in terms of like, like a 13 year old would actually, in my opinion, be way more immature than this. So she's, she's and I teach high school. So like, it's like <laughs> they're kind of crazy. <laughs> But um, yeah, so she's actually kind of mature for her age. She's just really young. So. Yeah, no, I definitely think she's mature for her age. And I, I mean, she's very, she's got those like 
this is the right moral principle and I will do it undyingly. Yeah, and that's a very adolescent thing to do, like to have that, like the world is not black and white. It, I mean, the world is not gray, it's black and white, you know, and it's like, this is the thing and there's no exceptions and you have to do the right thing and this is definitely it. And uh, yeah, so she's living in that world, which. Okay. So Gabriel makes another another great, you know, super sociopathic speech uh -huh. that when he gets away where he says, do you think this great enterprise of my life could be pinched out by a half penny peddler of arrows? Um, it just it's so over the top. Ugh. Is that an insult that we should, peddler, is Lyman selling arrows or something? Or is it just a comment about St. Mary's? Like, oh, maybe. I don't know. It's probably a Scottish expression. That unit of measurement I Googled while we were talking, it's a Scottish unit of measurement. Anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so then, just to make him the most over the top psychopath we could possibly have, he then threatens to, um, you know, abuse and rape the child. Yeah. It's kind of on par with what yeah. you know we expected of him though right you won't yeah which again maybe kill him like <laughs> if he escapes and this is what he's gonna do like maybe killing him is not a bad idea you know it's um so then he escapes he caught both the horse and the ship yeah, and it says because the French king's lieutenant in Scotland did not want trouble with the French king or the order, and because he suspected that Lyman's presence in Scotland might be an embarrassment to him, the order did not to pursue, did not come as readily as it might, and Grand Mallet caught both the horse and the ship. So, not good. It's fleed into the nether. Yeah. I mean, a little over the top in the sense of like how did gabriel know they were going to end up in the church and how did he have all these escape plans but then again he's an omniscient supervillain apparently so it's okay and maybe he just had somebody like have a horse ready wherever i am and so I mean, we do know he's got plans within plans within plans yeah. i mean there is a there is some hope in that lyman has set somebody on his trail so Unfortunately, it's not Tosh who seemed to be very successful at following Gabriel around. So who knows who he has set on his trail, but I'm sure we'll find out at some point. So, so then, um, then we have this like, uh, what is it called? Like this sort of discussion after the fact um, and Lyman, she's lost all his blood and is super beaten up is nonetheless like having this conversation well, after he stops the fight that almost happens. Um, but my favorite part of this is how Philippa just like barges in and grabs his arm and holds on to him because she's the only one that sees like this man is about to collapse. When it's <laughs> right. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, and we know that he's really, really hurt because he lets her. Absolutely. That's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you get the sense of the only reason he's still upright is because she's kind of supporting him. Which, uh, and then... I, I do, I, I love this thing where he says, um, the order should have learned that there's one thing more important by far than uniform piety, peace. And just that like all of this, these words and these rituals and this tradition, like it, it's not as important as peace. And I think that's why he was so like horrified by their like calling for the blood of the Turks is like, yeah. you know, like you're just causing more death and suffering in the world instead of preventing it, which is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. And then he refuses to be a royal tool, which we have heard. Like he's not going to be a tool of Grand Mallet. He's not going to be a tool of the Dowager Queen. But the best moment in this scene is <laughs> Philippa. Not only has she held on to him, but she's done this bit where she's like, has no one here any sense? <laughs> be quiet and sit down. The world will look after itself for a night without your hand on the rim. And Richard says, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh, good. Awesome, yeah. Because he's still like, blah, blah, blah. And she's just like, stop. <laughs> Sit down, shut up. Get some rest. I thought, um, it's interesting that the Queen Dowager, who at the end of the first book was like, it, it seemed really over the top. Like, you know, Lyman suffered so much. And now the opinion of him is turned around. And even the Queen herself is coming and like helping him. Um, and she seemed like very like good. Um, and now she's another enemy almost like she's very under suspicion and dark as a character now 
or at, at the very least she's just someone who's manipulating him who wants to manipulate him um and then there's this conversation about the order or sorry about saint mary's where lyman says um the reason that gabriel wasn't able to use the uh saint mary's the way he was going to try and use the order is because although we have men of religion among us we also have other yardsticks of thought and then you see why he brought like an architect and an artist yeah. and a lawyer and like all these <laughs> So that um so that it's sort of in inoculated against um this sort of grand mallet style manipulation because it has people who can think from all these different perspectives mm -hmm. right which is good and then we have this vow that he gives to his son at the end which is just Ooh. like wait for me new frightened soul I'm like oh i'm gonna find you probably <laughs> in the next book Hopefully. I really hope that the next book does not end without him finding him. And this, I mean, this impossible promise he makes at the end, like, I will not fail you ever. Like, that's, there's no way. Like, he's definitely going to fail his son. Like, that's an impossible promise. And like, even parents whose kids are like right with them and totally healthy and stuff, they still fail their kids. Like, Oh, so. Um, so I also love that it's Richard that helps Lyman over to the chapel where he makes the vow because they made up in this book. And yeah. Richard loves the yeah. For the second time. The second time, yeah. Um, and then the line that the, the altar, the the altar prevailed eternal untarnished over the memory of the enemy who carried its name. Which I think is interesting because like you could read this book as like, uh, against religion and against like the angel Gabriel, but it's not, it's clearly like, this guy is a sociopath manipulating those things, but he doesn't actually affect anything about what they mean to people for good reasons. And that like Gabriel's, Gabriel's um, usurpation of faith is not a comment on faith. It's a comment on Gabriel's evil. Yeah, and maybe it's a commentary on how people should use those other avenues of thought to like critically think before they just buy into something that sounds good. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and just how like emotionally manipulated or how easy manipulated, manipulated people are. Um, Don't be sure. Is it implying that Jarrett's family built this particular author, uh, altar? No, no, it's someone else from the same place or with the same people. I mean, I guess it could be a distant ancestor, but okay but i think it's um a real thing that happens to have been built by someone who was actually from blythe ah but you're right. not from blythe he's from not oh okay um but it's not there anymore do you know um the altar no there was this like almost entirely naked blonde man with long flowing hair sitting on the steps where it would have been outside of the church uh, oh. when I went there and I was trying to get a photo of the spot but I couldn't get one without this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll post a link to that in the no, no. But yeah Thanks. um so what do you guys want over one like your overall thoughts on this book which we kind of talked about at the beginning but yeah. uh, and then, like, what do you think is going to happen next and what do you want to happen next? I definitely think the next book will be all about Lyman trying to find his son. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to assume that since the last place that we know Una and um, Karedin were, were with Dragut, that he's probably going to start his search there. So I think, you know, D, you mentioned Constantinople as a place you'd like to see him go. I like, go there. I don't know. It's time. I we could go to like in North Africa maybe or you know there's I think there's I'm not sure where Dragut I did they say where Dragut was Algiers Algiers so maybe we're going oh. to Algiers yeah um but Somewhere in the Ottoman Empire yeah and I mean the name of the next book is Pond and Frankincense so that makes me think we're going somewhere in the Middle East or mm -hmm. North Africa like Frankincense is uh somewhere around there so um yeah i think 
and the, the just the title of the next book pawn and frankincense like it just makes me think the baby is the pawn and that's what i would assume yeah and not um because it's a yeah I, it's complex you know and 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 it obviously i'm sure the title has more than one meaning and like then it's good at multiple multiple interpretations of things but there's a little baby what's gonna happen with the baby hopefully he gets rescued do what i said hopefully he gets rescued yeah hopefully he gets rescued he's not dead for sure because that's just not interesting so like he's definitely alive and things are happening but um i don't know i feel like I can totally see this next book ending on another cliffhanger where it's like they find the baby, but he gets, he doesn't get rescued or something. And, and I don't know. We'll see. Multiple years have to go by because Philippa has to grow up. So mm -hmm. <laughs> just I'm, <laughs> I'm really interested giving your Philippa Lyman theory some weight here now that it's definitely developing into that way. Um, supposing that the baby and Una do get rescued and come back into Lyman's life, like what's the dynamic between Philippa and Una gonna be? Like I know, we know that Lyman doesn't really feel about Una that way, but now that he's had a child with her, like is that responsibility going to make him choose Una in the end? I don't know. Or what if, what if they don't get rescued immediately or possibility ever is not really not I, I think they'll maybe they'll get rescued maybe not una though um but what if the baby like is somewhere in the ottoman empire for like 10 years and then gets brought back to scotland or something like that's that would be a culture shock for this kid and it would be interesting to see Lyman deal with a son who doesn't know him, probably doesn't trust him, and is culturally completely different, like speaks a different language, grew up in a different culture. Like that would be interesting. Well, I think we also have to remember that if Lyman does go searching somewhere in the Ottoman Empire for his son and Una, Gabriel is going to be there as well. Absolutely. Oh, Asterisk. If Gabriel sort of somehow manipulates this boy into being loyal to him instead of lying. Well, depend on how long he's got the boy in his power. So, I mean, obviously he can't do anything to manipulate him at the moment because right. he's a baby. Okay. So. Oh. It just depends how much, how long of a time frame we're looking at here. Yeah. Yeah, that would help if we knew. I haven't looked at the third of the fourth book yet so I have no clue what the years are for it but and who's going to go with him who's going to help him on a search is he going to take all of St. Mary's does he have the power to do that I hope he takes his guys like the gang I want I want like I want like Archie and Adam and and uh Alec and like and Jared. Oh. huh and Jarrett and Jarrett and Jarrett all right Jarrett can go um and nicholas to nicolay although that's probably not going to happen because oh, yeah. he's a good person um okay so it's october of 1552 at the end of this book so okay so yeah who knows what and how do you find a baby like lost in the middle of you can't google his name yeah I mean, I guess Lyman does have connections to Dragoot, so he could just go and ask him. We've got the letter, because Graham left him that letter, sort of, as he left, didn't he? Or maybe not. Because he said something about, you'll see when you read the letter after I'm gone that oh. I've bought the baby back or something. So, like, I think he's implying that he's the only one that knows where the child is, that not even Dragoot knows where he's gone now. But I'm sure that would be the first place Lyman would check with to see, you know, tell me everything that I d don't know. Like, I wonder if this is going to be like a, um, 
like a like a quest you know <laughs> like we're gonna go on a quest to find the baby and so it's like you've got clue number one is to go to Dragoon and then you find clue number two and then we go off like on this I don't know epic quest to find the baby that would be that would be fun um also I'm sure disastrous like it's good to that they're gonna like I, I just wonder how many of char the characters we like are gonna die in the next book <laughs> I don't want I don't want to know that. I don't, don't want to die that we like. I suppose having a moment of silence on a podcast is kind of boring, but in lieu of a moment of silence, I just want to pour one out for Will Scott, Watt Scott, Tosh, Gideon. Tom Erskine. Tom Erskine. Tom I knew I was forgetting somebody. Trotty luck up. I don't know who you are at all, but I love you anyway. I mean Eh, I don't really want to throw Jolita in there, but she did. No. So. She has no wine board out for her. <laughs> um, even though it is tragic and sad that she died because she was abused her whole life and I'm sad for her, but hmm. no, Tom Erskine and Will and Watts God and Like yeah. I said, most of the supporting cast of book one. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, I'm trying to think if there are any characters that I, that I really, really, really want to survive to the end of the book. <laughs> series i'm like lyman <laughs> so i want them all to last till the end except I know, but i'm just trying to think of like if i had to pick a few who do i really 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 want to make sure don't die so it's like lyman sibylla i bet Richard. um i bet sala blanca will be very useful if they go into the ottoman empire so maybe he'll actually get like more of a sort of character growth yeah i hope he gets a story yeah he seems pretty cool um yeah i don't know i think we're just gonna have like th there should just be like a we should keep like a running death toll at the end of every book <laughs> like who dies this i would like to see die. lyman and richard a lot more of them but i don't think lime richard would go with him to search for a son because he's got too many responsibilities back many in scotland responsibilities. he's not gonna go that be, i, I kind of want the buddy comedy richard and lyman book I don't think it's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe it'll be the buddy comedy Richard and Jar or Lyman and Jarrett book, but. That's more likely to happen. <laughs> he needs to redeem himself a little bit more for me. because Jarrett does fill a very similar function in the narrative as Richard. He knew Lyman when he was young and he's very, very hot headed. Mm. Yeah. And very imperceptive. Yeah. But he loves Lyman underneath even though he doesn't get him at all. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, he's kind of like a, he's, he's like the, the junior partner in the buddy cop, you know, who doesn't really know what's going on and doesn't understand the rules and like goes herring off in the wrong direction. You know, <laughs> like he's like, he's like a super immature, emotional Dr. Watson <laughs> to, to Lyman Sherlock Holmes, you know, just, He's going to like make the wrong assumption and, and pick the wrong bad guy. And okay. if you, oh, God. No, it's all right. Well, I was going to say, if, if you read Captive Prince, um, which I was telling Dee about before, it's a, basically a Lyman fanfic that got published as original fiction. Um, mm -hmm. But it is basically Lyman and Jarrett love story, but it's like if Jarrett was a little bit more capable and if Lyman was a little bit less capable so that they're equals, like in terms of like power, um, it's basically that's the, the Lyman and Jarrett love story. But I say don't read it until we finish this because it is it is Lyman fanfic. It's full of stuff taken directly out of Lyman books and it'll spoil you. Okay, that is funny. I was, so I was laughing that you, you told me, you told me not to read the Captive Prince books but that I could read fanfic of the Captain Prince books because those don't spoil the story. I know, hard. <laughs> just funny to me. It's like you can you can't read the fanfic of the story you're reading, but you can read the fanfic of the fanfic. <laughs> That's okay. I think if I sent you any fake raps, they were like AU fanfics. Like, yeah, you did. You know. you can read them in. yeah. So they're, they're well, like, I'm still in the middle of the Untamed. Like we can't do any. No Captain Prince. I got to get into the Untamed. Definitely. You know, you know Untamed, as we, we are definitely going to do a video blog about why if you love Lyman, you have to watch Untamed because it's just like all the same tropes. It's so good. Cool. But yeah, so final thoughts on book three. I loved it. Um, it might be my favorite so far. It is mine. There are moments in book one that I just loved, loved, loved. 
but it really did feel like two separate books though with the beginning section and the 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 Malta section and the Scotland section so I mean I'm glad it was put together as one but yeah it was nice I really really liked it I'm looking forward to Pond and Frankincense I do think one of the things that I maybe takes it off the like top spot for me is that you see so little of the real Lyman in this book he's wearing such a mask the whole time mm -hmm. um, and you just get you get the little glimpses you know you get the speech about music you get like the look on his face when he finds out about the baby but there is, and, and if he's so snarky he's really funny during all the Malta scenes but um but like the the person we saw in the breakdown in the Dell with Richard like that like all the mask removed we, we don't get that at all in this book even in Queensway we got it a little bit more in the scene with Liam Rowe after Robin Stewart died yeah. um so I, I, do, I do feel like more of a remove from him in this book even though I obviously still love him in this book yeah do we get no spoilers obviously because I don't want to know any details but do we get to see more of the real Lyman like does it come out more later books or is he always sort of hidden in this way Yes, you'll get to see more of the real life. <laughs> yeah. That's good. And that's good. Like that makes me that me really makes me uh anticipate. And because I agree, I really love those scenes. Yeah. I mean she can't do all the build up without the payoff. Like that's what you want, right? You want to crack him open and see what's inside. Yeah. But I'm nervous. That makes me scared because cracking them open would be like, it will be because of trauma. Like, <laughs> I've been cracked open quite enough like already. Or something and, oh. well, it could be because it could be because someone, you know, finally gets through his shell and gets to his, you know. Maybe Felipe comes along. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah. Any final thoughts that either of you want to share? Just really looking forward to the next one. Um, yeah, there's a really nice through line from this one to the next one. Well, I don't know, I haven't read the next one yet, but like it's a good it's a good way to start up. We have the best idea of what's coming next, I think, than we have had in past books because he really could have gone anywhere in the past books. So, yeah, I think it's really a testament to Dunnett's skill as a writer and the way that she plays with genre that. I do think this next book is going to be Lyman looking for his son, but I have no idea how that's going to turn out. Like he could find him and bring him back to Scotland. He could show up and the kid has died. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but, or it could be this goose chase that lasts years. And, you know, the end of the book is like, he arrives where he thinks he is and he's not there. And then we go to the next book, you know, like, I have no clue where she's taking this. And I think that really speaks to her just because we we often know when we read a genre, we know how the book is gonna end. Like if you read a romance novel, you know you're they're gonna get together at the end. If you read a mystery, they're gonna solve the mystery at the end, you know. If you read so the way that she's able to kind of manipulate all of these genres, and we don't know where she's going. And that and it's enjoyable. It's still enjoyable, which I think is that's a really hard line to walk and she does a good job of it. So. Mm -hmm. Someone on one of the Facebook groups was like disagreeing with us um, when we were saying that the books are like very heavily trope driven. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they are incredibly trope driven. You can go through and pick out the tropes, like they're very blatant, but she's not genre driven. So that's why we can't predict what's gonna happen because she mixes and matches the genres so well. Genre is different than tropes. Yeah, and she's, she's very trope, she uses tropes as tools. Like she is very skilled in, in playing with all of these tropes and giving us like, giving us the expectation of the trope, but then twisting it or playing with it in a way that we don't know where she's gonna take it, which is not usually what happens with the trope. Usually if you have the trope, it's like, oh, I know this is gonna happen because you know the genre. And so because she's playing with genre in such a skilled way, we don't really know what's gonna happen. I almost forgot. I wanna show you guys all the fanfic that I, or sorry, all the fan art that I forgot to show you. Throughout. All the fanfic. <laughs> um, much of this, by the way, I couldn't show because it's spoilery. Like even like any portrait of Gabriel is a spoiler that he's evil pretty much. Oh, <laughs> show us all the portraits of Gabriel. Now that we know. 
Uh, so. Devil horns. All right. Can you see my screen? He looks like Draco Malfoy. He does. <laughs> he looks too young in this, I think. But this yeah. is way too young he's like in his 30s um this and he, i think he's more golden than this but still it's lovely um this is by silver. platinum um here's one of kate this is kate from the um, i would give you my soul in a blackberry pie oh, yeah. it's like on the side but anyway um beautiful and then here's gabriel and jolita uh gabriel right okay i like that one this is how you know he was evil from that. I wasn't sure if he would get he was evil. I she's got the, like the darkness around his eyes where I was like, or he or she, I don't know who the, the gender, but anyway, the, the uh, um artist has this kind of darkness around his eyes that makes me think like he might have guessed. He's yeah. got his boy witch eyeshadow on. Yeah, he's just got eyeliner on. He looks kind of good. So he's properly golden also. Yeah. And then Jolita. I don't know why it's like looking weird. Anyway, sorry. Um, here's Jolita. Which again, I think you could kind of guess that she's evil. She looks kind of shadier, no? Yeah, she does look a little shady. I like the cross above her head. That's a nice mm. little touch in the portrait. It's her brand. Oh, her signature. Oh. Uh, so that's Hell's Own Apollo on Tumblr. Uh, here's Invite Me to Your Memories um, on Tumblr. This is um, the scene with um, Lyman and Jarrett like right before the um, music speech. Okay. Are you doing this for a wager? Um, is what Lyman says before he then uh, gives it that whole speech. Cause he's like, um, you know, Jared's like poking at him. Okay, this is Prince of Pictou. This is, uh, there's a lot of Lyman Jarrett fan art from this person. <laughs> um, I hope they've read Captain Prince uh, more. Uh, Lyman Jarrett, Lyman Jarrett, Lyman Jarrett. <laughs> and then this I think is, oh, this is Lyman and Jolita. Sorry, it's like kissing a church. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a modern Jolita on Tinder. <laughs> Tinder. <laughs> this is super cute. Which, yeah, that's 100%. I like that. Um, and another modern Jolita from the same artist. What is she? Is she holding a gun? Yeah, that's when she shoots the horse, probably. Oh, yeah. And another uh, Lyman Jarrett. <laughs> okay, here is, this is Mongoose Land on Tumblr. Um, and this whole uh, creepy scene where Gabriel says, I desire to call you Francis. Is that permitted? It is out of affection and a purely spiritual love. <laughs> uh... uh. Here's a, a murder apricot from. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that is great. She is a murder apricot. <laughs> um, here's from Lenova Draws. Um, more of Gabriel being creepy. I wish you did not need to mock for all for of all men. My God could love you, and I too. <laughs> <laughs> No. No. Uh, uh, um, and here's another one from Lenovo Draws. This one you would have guessed that he's oh, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So good. Yeah, that is good. Um, so good. Yeah, that is good. I would have loved to see him played by Rucker Hauer. Oh, yeah. All right, hold on. Pausing it because the cat is on the what you require in this life is a meeting with Gabriel and his sister. Several months later, he did not. Oh my God, sorry, I've had to pause it. All right. Oh, oh that's, mm. I mean, good job. But. I'm resuming, ready? Yeah. All right. Um, this one is also from Lenova Draws. Um, what you require in this life is a meeting with Gabriel and his sister, if you remember from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> very, very, very clever. Now that was Villagen Villagenon. Oh god, we haven't talked about him in a long time. Oh yeah. He kind of like floated away. Yeah, he kind of just he disappears yeah. after the first part. Him and the Strozzi brothers. Oh yeah, I forgot about them. <laughs> I was paying so much attention to those characters at the beginning of the book. Um, yeah. 
Um, okay, this one I love too. Another oh, little draws. That is so good. Oh, that is creepy. Really good. Mm. Oh, and then here's the scene in Tripoli when they save the castle. Are you adding oh. water for their play? Yeah. All the gunpowder behind them. And then here's the horrible whipping scene and the the, the cut that Jolita did. Oh, so that's all the Lenova draws ones, I think. Oh no, there's one more. Anyway, um, oh, and this is also this is the same Lenova draws, uh, Gabriel and Jolita. Mm. Um, and this is a sketch of lots of. Uh, you just happened, but you flipped through one. Yeah, sorry, because it was by the same, I figured I should show everything from the same person. Uh, also, Lenova draws. And then this one is from, um, who is it from? C. Barrington. Uh, okay. And this is, I also love this scene. Um, you hear we all love him too much. Actually, maybe we looked at this one before. Anyway, um, Lyman being snarky to Jarrett about Gabriel, which just entertains me to yeah. no end. Yeah. Um, sketches from Bella Rowe of uh, the the men of St. Mary's. Aww. We got Alec and Adam, Fergie, Jared, and uh, I guess Adam's daily lime and appreciation sketches. <laughs> no exception. All right, because he keeps trying to draw lime and can't do it. <laughs> um, and uh, last but not least, also from Bella rolls on tumblr is this adorable one of philippa and kate the trouble about mr crawford is that he puts up with his enemies and plays mary hell with his friends this is when they're in the garden getting dirty yes exactly i like that they're in modern clothes for some reason <laughs> and the, the tag is too lazy to draw historical clothes <laughs> and philippa together <laughs> those are great yeah anyway i love fan art so i hope the artists don't mind um if they don't want us to share stuff they can ask me to stop but anyway i'll put links in the um video descriptions you can go like the art and thank the artist for it yeah those are great Yay. Um, okay all right onward. we good anything else onward to book four onward to book four all right well thank you so much everyone for watching us <laughs>